Good morning. Do you want to know a secret? I, I, I have an obsession with themes or umbrellas. Not literally. I, I, I've only recently taken to... And how, how long do you usually hang on to the average umbrella for? How long do you, do you manage to keep it for? Weeks? Months? Years? I don't think I've ever managed to hang on to an umbrella for more than about a month. First of all, I congratulate myself on managing and remembering to carry it around because it makes me feel like a grown-up. I'm so grown-up. I, I came into work once and went, look at me, I've got an umbrella. I even have a little pocket in the side of my rucksack where I can tuck my umbrella. And um, uh, and the, uh, uh, the sort of sense of maturity that that gives me is something I, I, I was quietly proud of. And then I notice a month later, oh, I, that umbrella that I had, which I bought from TK Maxx, actually, they very cleverly put a few by the till. And you go, oh, I'll just get one of those. And, and it disappeared. I go, I just suddenly notice, oh, yeah, no, I haven't. I've got, oh, well, I must buy another one. Anyway, I digress. I mean umbrellas in terms of themes and topics and conversations. So if I came up with 10 ideas about what we could talk about together today, I'm fascinated by the idea that they can all be filed under the same heading. And I've got a new one that has popped up in the last couple of weeks, and it's not a happy one, I've got to be honest with you. Uh, you've heard Nick talking this morning about the, the dentistry crisis. Um, apparently, they're launching pop-up dentistry vans. I think the plan is to tie a little bit of um, dental floss or, or cotton around your rotten tooth and then to tie the other end of it to the tow bar of one of these pop-up dental vans, which will then drive off uh, 10 to 20 miles per hour, depending on whether it's in a built-up area or not. And hey, presto, the, uh, the affected tooth is, is removed. It's, I mean, you know, they've come up with some very bad ideas, the Tories, but that one at least has the, uh, has the appearance of something that might work. So you've heard Nick talking about the dentistry crisis. You, Sheila yesterday touched upon, oh, in fact, went into great detail, on what the average subject of King Charles III could expect if they had just received a cancer diagnosis. It's grim stuff, isn't it? Do you, do you know what the mail does today? I know you think I'm obsessed, and you're probably right. But the mail today has... Uh, it's written, The left just can't wait to politicise King's cancer. What do you think they mean by politicise King's cancer? Or indeed... Um, indeed, what do you think they mean by the left? And they list a variety of, of journalists and commentators who have simply pointed out that if you aren't the king or you are not the beneficiary of, of you know, pretty top-notch private health, because I don't think with cancer, private health, well, it can, it can speed up diagnoses and things like that. But if you're not the king, you can expect a very different experience in the event of being diagnosed with cancer. Why is that left-wing? <laughs> well, I, I, so here is... And, and I wish him nothing but joy and, and a speedy recovery. Of course I do. The same with whoever in your life has got cancer. I hope they get better and, and, and soon. But how is it left-wing to say, oh, but of course, if you weren't the king, you would have a very different experience. So please just take with a pinch of salt all of the talk of... It being good, it's a public service in a way to draw attention to the issue of early diagnosis and early treatment is such a power. How on earth is it left wing to simply say, um, well, of course, my experience was very different. I don't know. But then again, these are mysteries for, for, for bigger brains than mine. I, that's three. So there's three things there. And the theme under which I'm beginning to think almost everything that pops up on our collective radar could be filed is this. I think we're probably going to have a new government by the end of the year. I, th I think, you know, all things being equal, it's highly likely that Keir Starmer will be prime minister. It's not certain by any stretch of the imagination. And there's a very worrying story in the news today about millennials. Has there ever been a more unfairly maligned generation than the millennial generation? Constantly under attack for being thin-skinned or eating too many avocados or not understanding that it's very easy to buy a house. All you have to do is um, hop in a DeLorean sports car with a flux capacitor, travel back to 1954 and, uh, and look at the ratio between average earnings and average house price income and fill your boots. Everybody knows that. But there's a very troubling story about millennials being less likely to vote. Worries that... Uh, a failure to vote among that generation could actually deliver a fighting chance to the Conservative Party at the next election. And, and that, to me, is baffling, because I would have thought that that generation would be the most politically uh, angry of all, the, the, the ones who've in some ways had their birthrights taken away by older generations, the ones who are going to have, for the first time in living memory, an inferior standard of living from their own parents. But apparently the reaction is perhaps to disengage 
rather than to push back or, or to vote. So that's a massive worry. The idea that, well, and we may look at that a little later. But the question under which I could file almost all of the conversations I was thinking of having with you today is this. And I, I've warned you already, it's not a pretty one. Are you ready? Is that now so bad that the new government won't be able to fix it? What would you point at first? So when the Labour, if the Labour government gets in later this year, they are going to have to fix this thing. What would you put on the list of things they're going to have to fix, which also admit the question, is it now so bad that they won't be able to? The government today trying to fix the dentistry crisis, the image of people in Bristol queuing round the proverbial block simply to get onto an NH dentist's books is a symbol of national shame. Do you know you have, I think, a better chance of dentistry in Ukraine? That must be from before the war, mustn't it, that comparison, than you do in the United Kingdom. Uh, another story yesterday about children under five, or earlier this week about children under five facing, um, uh, uh, I think, uh, among the worst health situations in in the civilized world certain certainly in the low low 20s 25th in europe or something like that extraordinary so here's something that the new government are going to have to fix right is it actually too big a problem for them to fix and that might be why some millennials are thinking of not voting but no well, housing housing health dentistry uh, what, what else would you put on the list? What did I talk about? Cancer waiting list. I suppose you file that under health. The water companies pumping shocking amounts of sewage into our rivers on a daily basis. I, I mean, what would be on the list of things that this next government is going to have to fix after 14 years of Tory rule? Dave's been in touch from Shepherd's Bush. He simply says everything. It's mad that, right? I apologize almost for introducing that into your life because now every time you hear a story in the news, you're going to wonder whether it gets filed under... Is that too big a problem for the next government to fix? I don't know. But I'll tell you what the biggest is. And I'll tell you something you may not realise. I don't know where you are at the moment. I don't know where you're listening to this. If you're in the bath or on your own in the car, that this won't work. But just think of the last time you were in company, the last time you were in a room full of people, or the last time you were sitting at a table with a bunch of others, the last time you were in the canteen at work, or even perhaps on a bus, although I, I, it works better, this thought experiment, if the company you're in is people you know and possibly even care for, friends, colleagues, but not people you know intimately, not your closest family. You're in a room with 10 people that you know or care for a bit, you know, like colleague friends. You don't know the ins and outs of their lives. You know a bit, but you like them. You enjoy their company. You care for them. There will be somebody in that circle, possibly more than one person, who is part of the story that dominates one front page today. The story of children being referred for emergency mental health care in England alone. And it's a story of a figure that has soared by more than 50% in three years. Now, I made a mistake this morning. I made a mistake of thinking that two stories were conflated. There is another story around about the number of people not going to work. And as I warned you some time ago, this will become an opportunity to attack people who are suffering uh, with their mental health. People who are unable to go to work will be portrayed as people who are unwilling to go to work. And while some people are undoubtedly unwilling to go to work, most people who go to work are unwilling to go to work, but they go to work. The difference between being unwilling and being unable is the difference between being cruel and being kind. Acknowledging the existence, if you must, of the unwilling, but please do not use them to malign the unable. The temptation to conflate the unwilling with the unable will be irresistible to conservative media. They have to. They, 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 they have to find someone to tell you to be cross with. Rather than being cross with the people who've been in charge for 14 years, who they encouraged you to vote for, they have to point towards problems caused by your neighbours or your, or your mum. So they, they're not going to work at the moment because their mental health is a mess. They must be malingering, work-shy layabouts, living off the fat of the almost non-existent welfare state. And I made a mistake this morning. I thought the two stories were linked, but they're not. An emergency referral to uh, child and adolescent mental health services is almost impossible to secure. In many areas, 
I, I, I don't know if it's time for a trigger warning, but I'm certainly going to tell you that some fairly grim phenomena are about to get an airing on this program. In many areas, you cannot get a referral to emergency mental health care, trigger warning, unless you have already attempted to take your own, to, attempted suicide. You can't get one. Self-harm, not enough. Clinical depression, not enough. An absolute inability to see any reason to be alive, not enough. In order to get an emergency referral for mental health care in England, in many areas, you need to have gone to the worst place imaginable, or rather failed to, to, to get there. And the waiting list, even if you get there, is almost unbearable. Just imagine for a moment if those pictures from Bristol this week, which has got everybody in such a tizzy, and dentistry is important, did you, for example, know? Do you know what the most common reason for a child under five to be admitted to hospital is in this country, in Brexit Britain, in Boris Johnson's Brexit Britain, in Rishi Sunak's Brexit Britain, in Rupert Murdoch's Brexit Britain? Do you know what the most common reason for a child under five to be admitted to hospital is? Go on, have a guess. It's to have a rotten tooth removed. Is that extraordinary? So I'm not making light of the pictures of people queuing around the block in Bristol just to get onto an NHS waiting list, an NHS dentist's list. I'm just asking you to imagine what you would think if that queue was children, suicidal children. Because there are currently 32,521 emergency and urgent referrals being made in this country and the waiting lists mean that 600 of them every week are deteriorating to such a state that they have reached crisis point. They've been stuck on the waiting list for an average of five months before they see anyone and in the worst cases as long as two years and remember you don't get on these lists in some cases, unless you've been to the worst place imaginable. Now, it's possible the Daily Mail will attack me for, let me get this right, politicising the mental health issue, because pointing out who's been in charge for the last 14 years is, is leftish propaganda. Pointing out the succession of health secretaries who uh, remain in cabinet in some cases and who remain in uh, conservative high command is, is, is almost endless. And pointing out what has happened over the course of that last 14 years, leftish propaganda. Why don't you talk about something positive, like all the benefits of Brexit? I will, when you give me some. But I today want you to tell me what it's like to watch your child, to watch your child's mental health deteriorate, knowing that there's nothing you can do about it. I don't want to score cheap points today by... But by attacking elderly, privileged men, talking about how the younger generation should be more robust, I, I just find it so exhausting and so pathetic. It's exactly the same as elderly, privileged white men talking about the, 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 the lad, the young black lad who's been stopped and searched six times in the last five months and never found once to have been committing any crime whatsoever. It's, it's as if, and I am, I suppose, getting ever closer to being an elderly, white, privileged man. I'm white and privileged. I'm not quite elderly yet. But my goodness me, the sooner we stop letting those voices dominate the national conversation, the sooner we'll start being able to address problems like this. Or they just need to pull their socks up and a stiff upper lip. The number of children referred for emergency mental health care in England has soared by more than 50% in three years. And that referral is not someone who doesn't fancy going to school or who's got the butterflies on the first day of term. That's someone who is seriously ill and quite probably suicidal. Um, I, and and I, I, I'm always keen for you to correct me on stuff. Um, Mark, who is a Samaritan, was telling us we must be careful to avoid the phrase commit suicide because it makes it sound like a crime. So just use died by suicide or similar. I'll try, I shall do my best, but I won't do it overnight. None of us can turn oil tankers around like that. But I knew somewhere in my mind that there was uh, something problematic about that syntax. And I'm happy that you're listening to tell me, Mark, what, what, what I should do differently. And I will in future. But just imagine for a minute if that queue in Bristol 
did not contain adults desperate to get on an NHS dentist list, but contained instead children who were suffering from serious mental health problems and were quite possibly suicidal. And then I suppose we should wonder whether Rishi Sunak would accept a £1,000 bet on whether or not that waiting list would be reduced by the time of the next general election. Probably he would. 18 after 10 is the time. So I want the reality of it. I, I know a bit about this. This world, I, I wish I didn't, but I do. And I want to know the reality of knowing that your child is in, unalmo in almost unbearable pain. But I want to talk about what you're going through today as a parent who can't do anything about it. And because these waiting lists are so long, the president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists puts it best today. Dr. Laid Smith says, no one should have to watch their child's mental health deteriorate while they wait for care. It's completely unacceptable that this is the reality facing so many families. I want to know what it's like for mum today. And I want to know what it's like for dad. And I know that often you will think it's not about me or I don't want to talk about my experience or what I'm going through is nothing compared to what my baby girl or my baby boy is going through. But I want to talk to you today because I, I want to know what it's like for you. I, actually, I... I I want everybody listening to know what it's like for you. I don't want this to be a political platitude or a, or a headline. I want the people that work with you who don't know what you're going through to have an idea of what you're going through. The people sitting around that table that we talked about earlier, the people in that canteen. Because whoever you are and wherever you are, if there are 10 people around you now, one of them will be involved in something like this. Hopefully not quite so far down the line, that an emergency and urgent referral to child and adolescent mental health services has been made. But you won't know. They'll be like swans. On the surface, they will seem serene. And below the surface, their, their flippers are going haywire. And, and when they leave the house in the morning and they close the door behind them, they do man up. They do gird their loins. They do stiffen their sinews and their upper lip, which means that by the time they get to your place of work or your school or, or, or even just meeting for a coffee they're not giving you you don't know so today I want you to tell them what it's like oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three no one should have to watch their child's mental health deteriorate while they wait for care says the president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists but they are having to do that you are having to do that and I want you to tell everybody else what it's like. Okay? Thank you. It's 10.21. It is 24 minutes after 10. Apologies. I, I went on rather longer than I expected. But as I say, I'm not sure. Well, certainly for people affected by this issue, there is no more important story under the sun. And yet yesterday, the kind of politicians that we spend a lot of time lambasting on this program were queuing up to tell us that they're the ones we should trust with, with getting everything sorted out. 14 years in power. And Liz Truss still trying to blame everything on, um, the, what was it, the tofu-eating wokarati. Craig's in Norwich. Craig, I'm sorry you can ring in on this topic, but but what, what made you pick up the phone? It's, it's well, it's just the um, things that are, that are happening at home with my daughter. Um, she's 14 and a half. Um, she's self-harming. And she wants to end it all. And there's absolutely no provision out there whatsoever. Nothing. They, they just get letters back from the doctors all the time, saying um, from um, you know being referred onto um, mental health yes. things, just saying um, it, it doesn't meet the criteria yet. Unless some, she actually tries to kill herself, that, that's then in front of in, in front of you in in black and white. Because I, I think yeah. some people listening yeah. will have thought that perhaps yeah. I was exaggerating or yeah. I'd got the end of the stick or no. no. No, I've got a letter saying it, 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 her, her mental state at the moment um, does not meet the criteria for any help. Because she hasn't made an and actual attempt on her own life. No, she hasn't made an actual attempt. She's been self-harming for, uh, well, we found out just a couple of months ago. And um, she actually did it last night. She oh. came up to our room about half midnight. 
and said, I've, I've, you know, I've self-harmed. And we sort of sorted her out. Um, I was talking to her and she said, I just want to end it. And, you know, we know what she means by that. There's nothing, nothing we can do. Well, you, you, you know, we, you, we love... You, you know, are we, there. You are there and you are love. But beyond that, yeah. you feel that... And, and we mustn't underestimate what a huge part of the process potentially that will be but you, you you're her dad you want to fix it right yeah yeah we want to fix it um we really do we, we can't imagine what she's going through um you know I, i'm to say to your research i'm fortunate i i earn a, a good salary six figure salary yeah. and we're paying out privately and um, for counseling um, once a week it doesn't seem to be doing much but we're in that position to be able to do it. How many people can't? Yeah, uh, and as just, you say, even, even that isn't, isn't necessarily the sort of high-level psychiatric care that she probably needs. So, so no, psychiatrists, exactly. psychiatrists can prescribe drugs, and but psychotherapists well, can't. That's often she, she can't. She's, she's not even. She's not sleeping at night. No. Uh, there's a whole host of things why she's done this because she had years of emotional abuse with her mum when she was living at her mum's. Right. Um, the family courts were absolutely rubbish and they didn't help. Um, and we've been trying to get her from her mum's for oh, years. Yeah. And eventually, July last year, two days before the end of school, she said, I can't go home to mum's. Right. And we had to go through the court period. And we, we, we were told why she couldn't, why okay. she didn't want to be. She said why she didn't want to. And it was horrific, the mental, the amount of a men, mental and emotional so got, abuse that was going on in the house. Apart from anything um, else, she'll have some form of PTSD quite possibly, won't she? She'll be she has. Yes, yeah, she has, and she just feels she feels guilty that she's not living at her mum's. She doesn't want to see her mum, but she feels guilty. Um, she said she doesn't like her friends anymore. She hates school, although she's a straight-A student. Yeah. Everything's getting on top of that, and there's absolutely no help. And we're just watching her fade in the way. What? What? Was your? I p- apologise for this question, but it, I think I should ask it. You don't have to answer it. W- what was your initial thought when you discovered? Because nobody listening to this, there'll be plenty of people still not sure that we've got our facts right, even though you're smack in the middle of it as we speak. Yeah. The idea that your little girl can be suffering so, so badly and that there is literally nobody you can turn to. Could you... I presume you couldn't quite believe it. You just thought, oh, I must have phoned the wrong number or we must have not knocked on the right door or we must have spoken to the wrong doctor. The idea that there is nothing is almost yeah, inconceivable. Yeah. In 2024, in one of the richest economies in the world. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, um, you know I knew things were, 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 you know, cams and places like that. I knew things were tight. But we went to, went to the doctors and until the doctor was very sympathetic, um, listened, and said, yep, you absolutely need help. Put the referral off. And until we got the referral back, that was in black and white yeah. of this does not meet the criteria for any help at the moment. So everybody listening was, can, can he- talk- hear the pain in your voice and you're not even one of the emergency referrals. <laughs> no, no. So you've got no date. No. There's not even... So there's people sitting there waiting for no. 18 months, waiting for six months, and they have a, at least a light at the end of the tunnel, even though, even as they suffer the torture of watching their child's mental health deteriorate in front of them. You don't even have that. She moment. doesn't meet the criteria. Until she actually attempts something, they're not interested because they haven't got the capacity. Oh, my. I'm so sorry, Craig. You know, and I, I, I... You know, it's, it's oh. awful for... Awful for my daughter. It's awful for us. I'm about to go off to work. Yeah. Um, I work abroad. Um, my wife's a nurse, so she's stressed to sure. high heaven yeah. in an underfunded department. Um, we've got two other kids. I've got two step kids. They don't know anything what's going on, no. apart from something's going on. Yeah, they're younger, they're younger um, are they? Just, or? It's, yeah, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, well, they're twelve and ten. Okay. Um, we don't want them to know, and my daughter doesn't want them to know. Just the pain um, that she's what's in. going on, but it, this just changes the whole family dynamics because every everyone is walking around on tent hooks, on eggshells. You know, I go away to work. Um, I'm away for four, three, four, five days out of the country. Come back, I'm dreading. I'm, I, every time I go to work, I'm dreading getting a phone call from my wife. 
I, 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 I'm going to read you something from someone who I know knows what you're going through. All right, and and you may already have heard this advice, and it's not much, but I I I, I will vouch for this person. All right, and and they they say ideation can't be fixed. In my experience, it just gets put off and put off and put off. In that moment, instead of reaching for sharps, try to get her to squeeze ice cubes. It provides she's a. Done that. She's tried it. You, I thought you were going to say she, that it hasn't worked. She's tried it, and I asked her yesterday when she came up at you know, half half midnight, one yeah. in the morning. I said, "Did you not? You know, yeah. What about the ice? She said, it doesn't work. It's not enough. No, to take her brain out, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Oh, mate, I, I wish you there know, was more I could just, say. It's just, just disgusting. Yeah, what's going on in this country? It's just disgusting. And I guess the only way that things improve is conversations like this reaching parts that they're not currently reaching. But I, I, I send you all the love, mate. I really do. Everybody listening does. And I, I, I wish there was more I could say about what you might do to improve things. But the whole point of this dismal, dismal story, not, not just Craig's, but the whole topic, the whole point is that, that this is it. This is the reality for thousands and thousands of families. And remember, this is a story... <laughs> about referrals soaring by more than 50%. And I, listen, I've got no beef with you if you thought I was exaggerating or if you thought I must have got my facts wrong. It's happened before. But the very first caller, the very first dad, the very first parent, smack in the middle of the scandal that I described. You can't even get one of these referrals with its 18-month waiting list in some cases unless your baby girl, your baby boy has already gone to that place that Craig's girl thankfully hasn't gone to. It's 10.33, Thomas Watts has the headlines. 10.37 is the time, you see what I mean, about problems being, so. and this is such a failure, a deliberate failure, I think, of media. Well, what are they trying to get you angry about today, I wonder? I, I genuinely wonder, I don't think I've even checked. But the scale of some of the problems that the next government is gonna have to try to fix is almost unimaginable. You, you've just heard from a father whose whose daughter can't access mental health support unless she makes an attempt on her own life. It doesn't matter that she's self-harming. It doesn't matter how poorly she is. The system's so completely broken. Uh, the the post-lockdown period has exacerbated problems that were already there. We haven't mentioned criminal justice. Uh, that I've, Almost everything that is proper news in this country, as opposed to a manufactured culture war or, or ludicrous attention-seeking from people like Liz Truss, Almost everything that is proper news in this country at the moment can get filed under. I, I don't even know how the next government is going to begin to try to fix the problems that they're going to inherit. And yet, to, to listen to most Tory broadcasters or to read most Tory newspapers, you'd think that the biggest problem the country was facing was, I don't even know what they're going for at the moment. Oh, Prince Harry only spent 45 minutes with, with his dad yesterday. I even thought, because you remember the Daily Mail has tried, I said, why are the left politicising King Charles's cancer? You say, what do you mean by politicising? Oh, it's just pointing out what the waiting list is for the average subject of, of King Charles. It's not politicising and it's not left wing. You know, Tories get cancer too. I don't know whether you knew that. Um, but I, I've seen one, well, there's quite a lot of weirdos now making a living on, on these um, new channels. An extraordinary amount. I, know I saw one of them this morning. It somehow crept through my Twitter um, portcullis. One of them suggesting that part of the reason Prince Charles has got cancer is the stress of having to deal with Prince Harry and his wife. Now, I got a message off a mate of mine, which I didn't share with you yesterday because I thought it was a little bit close to the bone, but it made me chuckle. And the message said, I can't believe Meghan has given Charles cancer. And, it, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a bit of a wincing gag, isn't it? It's a bit of a... <sighs> It doesn't actually have a victim, that joke, except the people that try to blame Meghan Markle for everything from trying to poison her bridesmaids at her wedding by having a flower in her bouquet identical to one that Kate Middleton had in hers, or um, somehow her fondness for avocados is uh, a, a cause of gang warfare in South America, which uh, both of which have appeared in the British media. But I can't believe that Meghan has given King Charles cancer. It's quite a good, albeit fairly edgy, gag. And then it ceased to be satire earlier this morning when, when I saw someone literally suggesting it on, on I forget which one of the, of the new, strange new television channels it was. It's mad, isn't it? And yet the real news 
is sometimes it feels too terrible to talk about, not least this one. What's it like to watch your child's mental health deteriorate knowing that there's nothing you can do to help, up to and including taking them to the people we pay our taxes in expectation of treatment from? Leanne's in Bournemouth. Leanne, what would you like to say? Hi. Um, so, I mean, I can tell you it's, 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 it's horrendous. It's just awful. My daughter is 14 now, and this started when she was 10. Um, and going back um, all the way, it's just she's been let down every step of the way. You know, when she was in primary school, it was suggested that, that she was autistic. Um, right. But CAMS had closed the waiting list then, so you couldn't get a diagnosis unless you went privately. And even then, the, the waiting list for a long time. And she was okay. You, you thought, well, you know, she's autistic, but she's okay. Um, and then she wasn't okay. The first lockdown happened when she was in year six. And, um, and she just started to withdraw. You know, she stopped smiling. She stopped laughing. She cut off all her friends. And we contacted the GP. We contacted CAMS. Yeah. And no, you know, she's, you know, there was no help. So she started secondary school. Um, and day one, she had a mental breakdown. She just walked into that that hall with all the 200 and something year sevens and, and said she wanted to die. And then the self-harming happened, started every day at school. Um, she said that she, you know, she would come out of school and she wanted to just throw herself in front of the car. Um, and, and, you know, we, we kept on asking for help. It wasn't until she actually did attempt suicide that we did get a referral to CAM, yeah. even with all the self-harming and the, the not being able to go into school. But then the yeah. second lockdown happened. Um, and we were still on the waiting list for CAM. And we were finally given an appointment, but it was going to be, I think it was six months wait. I, can I, I'm going to pause you there, if I can, because I want, I, want, I want you to talk about you a bit. I want you to tell me what that's like, because there is a presumption, and I don't think it's, it's a naive presumption or, 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 a, or an optimistic presumption. There's a presumption that when you see the pain your child is so obviously in, there must be a safety net. Right, there must be help. Absolutely, you feel help. You 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 feel hope. You think that yes. the school will help, and the school was saying, you know, you, you know, we've seen kids like this before. It will be absolutely fine. Right, you know, just keep getting her in. Get, keep getting her to the gates, and then we'll get her in. And I kept trying and kept trying, and and kept waiting for the town's referral. And and then there was one day she said to me in the car, she she would have panic attacks every day before. She, before she went in the gates and she just said, I want to kill myself, I want to die. And I said, yeah, of course, but you, you need to go to school. <sighs> and I drove away and I just, I just, and that was the last time I sent her in. Really? I, you know, I can't believe I've just sent my daughter into school and she just told me that she wanted to kill herself. Yeah. Um, but you don't know what to do. You don't know, you don't what, know to what to do. do. No. And then, and then we, we got this CAMS appointment, but then literally a week before it, the psychiatrist left CAM, yeah. and so they cancelled it. There's and some said, unfilled vacancies in some health authorities. There yeah, some... I mean, it's, it's just the turnover has been unbelievable yeah. in the last four years, and and so we couldn't wait. I mean, she was desperate. We'd had a second to this attempt by then. Oh, I'm so sorry. And, um, and so we, we said, well, we're going to have to go privately. We can't wait. And they said, yes, no, you should go privately, you know, and, and you know, you'll stay on the waiting list with us. Yeah. So we went privately, and the private psychiatrist, you know, gave us some meds, but did mm. say, you know, you, you need to go through CAMS because yeah. it has to be joined up sure. with the school and with NHS. And so we said, okay. But then we went back to CAMS, and they said, well, you're not a priority anymore because you've been a private psychiatrist. Um, so <laughs> and, then she, and, then, and then she started, she, had a, she, she um, started an eating disorder and um, stopped eating. Right. And I mean, just stopped eating completely. It was it was it was it was awful. God. And she ended up hospitalised right. um, for that. And that kick started things because then social services became involved, and social services can push buttons that yeah. that, that we can't. And but even then, before that, when we saw the eating disorder starting, I contacted the eating disorder team, took her to the GP, yeah. 
and they said, well, she's, she's not low enough weight. You know, she had a BMI of 16, which isn't actually what they, they, they measure, right. at, you know, but that's pretty low. <laughs> and she wasn't eating. And they said, yeah, but her weight's not low enough yet. It wasn't until she was actually hospitalized that they said, okay, we'll see her. And she was diagnosed as anorexic. And then Cam didn't want to know. And in why this not? time then, why, why, because, why? because she has an eating disorder, so it's all because she... So that's not Cam's yeah. anymore? That falls under somebody else's auspices? It, it, yeah, okay. it's, they're kind of right next to each other, but yeah, it falls yeah, under something yeah. else. And they said, well, obviously all her mental health issues are because of her, her eating disorder. And I was saying, no, it's not. It's because the eating disorder is a symptom. It's yeah. not the cause, yeah. you know, and you're, you're refusing to treat the symptom. You know, we're two years in now with two suicide attempts and now, and now an eating disorder. In this time, she has been diagnosed as autistic. Right. So eventually, you know, the eating disorder team, they sign her off, they get her back to weight, but they never address the mental health issues. They literally just weigh her every week. Sure. Um, get her eating again. So then she goes back to CAMS and they right. said, okay, maybe it wasn't eating disorder. You know what it is? It's because she's autistic. I said, no, it's not. I'm autistic. My son's autistic. This yeah. isn't autism. This is not what this is. And they just keep on and keep on and saying, no, that's, that's what this is. Um... You know, and, and no help. And, this, you know, at this point, she's been out of school for two and a half years. You know, you know, and then and then the services that are supposed to provide an education for her don't. No. Um, they, they like you they're know. They're buried, I think, aren't they? Yeah, and they're they absolutely are. They are. buried. She's entitled to an education and she wasn't course, getting yeah. one. And all she was seeing was me. And I'm at home. I've had to give up work. Yeah. I'm, I'm her mental health nurse, which is a very sort of supportive type role, but then I'm also her eating disorder person, yeah. which is a very dictatorial role. Sure. And then they also want me to be her teacher. I can't do that. And her parent. I can't be all of those people to her. You and, know? And yet you have to try because there is no alternative. Yeah, you have to try because there's no alternative and there's no help. And, and at this point she's giving up. She says there's no hope. Nobody's helping me. She gets angrier and angrier with each medical appointment with each person she has to see because they don't they end up not helping her and then they end up leaving the service if it's so, can. that chips away at any any semblance of optimism yeah. that she's managed so to she, hang on to any, exactly. any sense so of like, light no, nobody's gonna help me all these people they don't care about me you know and that's and and it's hard to disagree with her yeah. because because they're not helping and they don't seem to care and Eventually, I said to Cam, the Cam psychiatrist, you know, and, and, and you've got to remember at this point as well, all of her disorders are dealt with by different people. Yeah. You know, so none of it is joined up thinking. And none of it and, can uh, be. And, and, and this is where you are now. This is what you're in the middle of right well, now. So finally, I mean, I, I, they said, well, if you want a second opinion, if you don't think it's a sort of thing, you have yeah. to get a second opinion. You have to go privately. I said, fine. Sure. But no private psychiatrist would see her. Really? Because she's too complex, okay. because she has an eating disorder, she's autistic and she's suicidal. Right. So then they said, but what you should be doing is asking for a, a tertiary referral to a, psychi a, a psychiatric hospital in yeah. London. Yeah. But Cairns had never said this was an option. When I back to, went back to Cairns and said, can I have this? He said, oh, yes, you can. But they didn't, I had to find that out from somebody else. They never offered it to me. Uh -huh. So we're now under the assessment process with this. Um, with this hospital who have now seen her and we're waiting for a report and she's finally no school where we live would right. see her would have her because of her mental health issues but you know they finally found a school an hour away so I now do you know an so, hour each way twice yeah. a day to yeah. take her and to, and to bring her back and it's it's not a school that you know helps you know she's a very clever girl she could do well academically but you know, that's out the window now. This is a school that just looks at her just to life her, skills. And, yeah, exactly. Keep her going. So you just... So things are a little better than they were, but not on anything like the scale that you might reasonably have expected. And and I, I know it doesn't feel like it to you, Leanne, but you've actually had more help than a lot of the parents getting in touch with me today. But it's, as you say, it's sclerotic. It's disconnected and, and sometimes it's unhelpful. And, and they're not telling you about stuff you can get. But again, that sense, as with Craig, it's that presumption, that perfectly normal presumption. Imagine if you broke your leg. And you turned up at hospital and they said, oh, sorry, we can't see you until you've broken the other one. That, that's what we're talking about here. Or, or we can't see you until you've broken both your arms. Just that 
completely, what's the word I'm looking for? Com completely casual presumption that the, the help will be there when you seek to access it and to find out that it isn't. I should, I, I'll read one message quickly. Actually, I'll do it after the break. I, that, that conversation has understandably gone on um, a lot longer than we, we scheduled for. Leanne, love to you all and, and, and take care. And I know it doesn't feel like it, but deep down you know she's lucky to have you in her corner and God knows where she'd be if she didn't. It's 10.54, a couple of things. Um, almost all girls, you've noticed, and, and, and the same is reflected on our switchboard, which is the second of the couple of things I wanted to tell you. Y you know I tease you sometimes about how easy it is to make the phones ring. You just say something about parking tickets, or uh, is there anybody old out there feeling poorly, or, or on immigration, isn't it awful? And the phones will ring off the hook usually. But if it's a very specific inquiry about people going through a very specific experience... Sometimes you only need three or four calls. It breaks my heart to tell you that, the, 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 as you may well have discovered yourself already, you can't get through to the studio at the moment for love or money. And every single person getting in touch is ringing in with an experience like the ones we've heard, not with an opinion or with, a, uh, with a, some advice about pulling your socks up and being more resilient. They're, they're ringing in with tales of, of, of unimaginable horror and pain. And the reason I mention girls is because I think boys find it even harder to come forward and tell their family. So suicide statistics among, among young men and boys are, are shocking and measurably higher. And, and I'm not an expert, and I hesitate even to dip a toe into the world of analysis in this field, but I think that's probably not a coincidence. I think the fact that girls can and are raised often to talk about their feelings when boys aren't probably explains the disparity in both suicide statistics and the conversations we're having today. Uh, I'll read this from Jamie, who's in Tunbridge Wells, because it's, it's the closest we'll get to uplifting, I think. My wife and I are going through exactly what your first caller is going through. Fortunately, we are at a stage where we can see light at the end of the tunnel. The only advice I can offer is don't measure progress in days or weeks. Reevaluate monthly. Prepare for backward steps. My wife and I can only have comfort in the fact that our daughter does speak openly to us, which means we have a chance to intervene. We were also very lucky to have medical insurance and, and the ability to pay for private treatment. My heart breaks for those who are unable to. We are resigned to a lifetime of fear to a greater or lesser extent. And of course... <laughs> I, I, no one ever worries about mum and dad in these situations. Even the people closest to you will be worrying about your daughter or your son more than they'll be worrying about you. Callum's in Southampton. Callum, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello. Uh, I listen, listen to your shows most days, uh, and this one, you know, I had to pick the phone up. Yeah. Uh, so our daughter's 17 now. We've been lucky enough to be in the CAM system for four years. Right since lockdown uh, when our daughter contracted quite a severe eating disorder. Oh. Uh, it's the worst thing that's ever happened to us and you wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy. We saw her literally waste away in front of our eyes in the space of a couple of months, God. resulting in hospital admission into general hospital where her condition worsened because they just didn't know how to deal with someone in her you know, critical situation. She then progressed to six months inpatient care in a specific eating disorder unit. Uh, and we got her home in March 2021. Right. And then have literally been under the CAM system and fighting with the CAM system ever since. Uh, and I can completely relate and feel for everyone that you've spoken to already because we've been going through exactly the same. The, the terms that stuck out for the lady that was just on before yeah. me are being told that your child, who had lost a third of her body weight and was close to dying was almost not sick enough. Uh, and the fact that they, and it's still, there's, a, there's a quite a big campaign going on about it, especially relating to eating disorders, right. uh, excuse the specifics, that they use BMI as a triage tool for treatment of people with eating disorders, where eating disorder is a mental health condition. Uh -huh. So they're using a physical attribute to decide whether your child is actually going to get support and, 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 or not for a and, and, mental health condition, which is, yeah, it's I, I suppose not. it's easier to measure, isn't it? But not not in a way that's helpful for anybody involved in the process. And and listen, if there's finite resources, this is the thing about CAMS and probably the reason why people, why the turnover of staff is so high, because it must be almost unbearable for them to do what you're describing, yeah, well, where they well, have to know. tell people, no, you do this job, you train to treat 
and then you're telling people you can't help them because you're not sick enough. Exactly, and we know for a fact, and one of the other points I was going to raise as well, I think that there's people in the CAM system that are, well, we know one person in our area that yeah. was there at the start of our daughter's care, that she's actually left CAMS now through mental health effects of her own. Right. Because the, Do you mean the worker I mean, has, I the staff very, member? There's some very good... There's some very good people in the system, I think. Yeah. And they're at burnout point as well because, you know, if of you're diligent they're. and professional and, and you want to do a good job, if you're having to turn these kids away that, you know, you can see that desperately need help. Well, it's traumatic for nothing, for, if it's nothing oh, else. Yeah. So they end up burnt out, their mental health suffers, they sign off sick and then they open up their newspaper and turn on their radio to hear some Tory blowhard telling them to pull their socks up, stiffen up their lips and get back to work ASAP. It's an extraordinary yeah. it's situa- vicious circle. Yeah, the situation we're in now, our daughter, we've gone through three suicide attempt situations. Oh, uh, two of them that have ended up with uh, A&E visits. Yeah. Where A&E just, again, at the moment, they're not resourced to deal with mental health conditions. So they deal with the physical uh, and we get sent packing again. And the, the reason I really called in, the, the most damning thing that we've had to deal with is that the last time we went through that situation, uh, the people in A&E put a referral into the CAMS crisis team, which are like, they are like the uh, the 999 side of CAMS where you phone yeah. when you're in like an absolute desperate emergency. And it took five days for them to get in touch with us after this attempt. Because they're dealing and with five days worth of comparable emergencies, to be clear, isn't it? I don't exactly, think it's yeah. laziness. I know you're not suggesting this, but just for the benefit of the tape, it's because they're dealing with five days worth of comparable situations. And, and it, it, you know... Because the five days was because they sent us a letter. Oh, God. It wasn't a phone call. It wasn't an email. Yeah. It was a letter. <laughs> you know, they've come through the post. You're like, this is supposed to be an emergency service of yeah. all emergency services. Yeah. So they don't help themselves in some instances. No, but... I take your point. I take your point. And, and, and uh, I mean, the system is not designed by the people who are trying to run it, is it? But so are you in a better place now, mate? Or are you still taking it one step at a time? Well, we're pretty much like the guy uh, that, that you read his text out, that yeah. we are, you, you're almost sat around, you're resigned that this isn't the end of it. And you know, you've kind of just sat around waiting for something else to go wrong, waiting for the next episode. Yeah. Well, good luck. Uh, rarely have those words sounded less adequate. Um, last word on this to Anne, who's in Bristol. I can't call you today, but I can describe the trauma of that CAMS letter that you are so desperately waiting for to drop through the door to tell you that your precious child is not ill enough you're left with fear guilt despair and crushing loneliness thank you just for discussing it today i wish i could do more it's 11:01, and um in the next hour this is an extraordinary story that we have probably may have popped up as much as anything else over the last 20 years but i can't remember an example as stark as this eight metropolitan police officers are under investigation after a child was stopped six times in five months with nothing criminal ever being found. I don't need to tell you the ethnicity of that child, but I do need you to tell me what that sort of experience does to a young black boy. Uh, six minutes after 11 is the time. I wasn't going to do this, but I think given the, the power of the last hour and perhaps the need for at least a wry smile at the top of this one before we get stuck into the story of the of the of the young man who has been stopped six times in five months by the metropolitan police despite never once being found to um have done anything criminal i i want to perhaps point towards why things like child and, and young adult mental health services are in such a mess there are some obvious answers such as austerity cuts and 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 crisis uh, you know and a huge uptick in these sort of problems um partly uh, uh, it would seem as a consequence of lockdowns uh, probably unavoidable actually given the necessity of lockdowns but but still uh, the system utterly unprepared for any sort of increase uh, that gives some sort of excuse but the system before lockdowns was already straining was already struggling just as the court system and the criminal justice system but but a couple of things i've got a few clips for you I, you know i know how much you like clips so th- there was a bloke on newsnight last night who's a former advisor to liz truss when she was actually prime minister the liz truss is complaining at the moment and and i, I would love to ignore liz truss and i think we probably will soon but she has been a cabinet minister. She has been prime minister. She has been 
um, a senior member of successive governments, possibly more so than any Tory politician since 2010, because so many moved out with Cameron and, and didn't manage to curry favour with the new regimes. But uh, you listen to someone who's sitting in Downing Street with her, uh, uh, supposedly as a policy advisor or a special advisor. I don't know if you saw Newsnight last night. He looks like a trainee manager with a trainee moustache. And the, this is part of the reason why the country is in such a mess. This is a central thesis. You don't even need to check what this guy's background is. He either comes from Tufton Street or some mad right-wing website, or quite possibly both. Um, these are the kind of people that have somehow got close to power, got their hands on the reins of power. And every now and then, the BBC still manages to put them in a room with a journalist who deserves the title journalist, in this case, Victoria Derbyshire. Have a listen to this. His, his name is Hugh Bennett. He's a former advisor to Liz Truss when she was Prime Minister. And this is the calibre of character that has been adjacent to power and advising power, while things like the dentistry crisis, the child mental health crisis, the cancer waiting list crisis, the water companies crisis, the NHS crisis in, in general, the, the, the criminal justice system crisis. You pick a crisis. These, these, these are the people who were supposedly charged with fixing it. Why should any voter listen to Liz Truss when she frightened the markets to such an extent that the pound fell against the dollar, sent mortgage rates soaring and forced the Bank of England to intervene to save our pensions? Yeah, well, look, I think when you look at what was said today, when you look at what the focus was of, of the event today, it was much less about, you know, what are the short term policies that we, we need to do now before the election? It was no, more no, actually sorry, uh, what, what? it's actually about whether people would listen to Liz Truss because of because of the disastrous 49 day premiership. Yeah, I mean, I think the, po the, the thing with what judging what Liz was saying is I think you should people should be judging her and what she said today. Not, uh, not on her actual record in office. Look, I think look, she can. I thought she you can, wanted to make bring that. the link back between accountability and and democracy. Yeah, and I'm sure I think I, I'm sure she'd be the first to admit that her term in office didn't go the way the way that she intended. But I think that's not to say that the ideas that are being discussed today. I think actually trying to start a more serious conversation about you know what are the longer term institutional reforms we need in this country. How do we actually start you know building a coherent policy platform rather than just short term which factions in who's fighting who from one day to the next. You know who said this who said that. I think it is really part of it. You know, from what I saw of it, it looked like a much more serious effort to start a you know a cohesive piece of work thinking about what does a real program of reforms look like that can sort of bring conservatism back into the mainstream and in a popular way. I was referring to an event where Liz Truss claimed that you need to watch GB News and read the Daily Telegraph to, to, to find out what real politics should should be looking like. So people like that getting into power, getting close to power, and we sit here wondering why things are in such an almighty mess. Up next, it's our old friend Jacob Rees-Mogg with our actual friend Lewis Goodall from the News Agents. You um, railed against Davos, man. How much money did you make in the city? That rather is I've never, oh, That's such a childish question. Well, it's not, it's I've never childish. had anything to do with Davos, and I know that you've become a very left-wing broadcaster. What will success for this project look like, Mr. Reese? Well, what we're doing is talking about the ideas that conservatism needs. So it's a question of whether people find these ideas resonate with them. That will be success. Is it not rather pathetic for members of a party, senior members of a party like yourself, who've been in government for 14 years, to rail against the system. If you don't mind my saying so, you sound rather left-wing. You sound rather like a sort of right-wing Benite, constantly saying, you know, power is the problem, institutions are the problem, they have to be changed. No, I think you've got it fundamentally wrong, that we had no ability to change the system until we'd left the European Union, and we then had Covid, and all parties at all times need to be thinking about the structures of government, how things work, how they operate, because the way to get things done is through the structures of government, and sometimes they need changing, and they were changed very effectively by Tony Blair. So you didn't have power to change the schooling system? We, talked we did change the schooling oh, system, as Liz Truss said, perhaps you should have listened to her speech. I did listen to it. And she she said about one of the things we did successfully was in she, education. And yet she talked about wokeism in schools. If there's wokeism in schools, your government could remove it at a stroke, surely? Not at a stroke, no. You need to legislate and new guidelines have been issued, so these things are moving in the right direction. So the but things, well, we need to move further and faster. This is the whole life and blood of politics. You um, railed against Davos, man. 
How much money did you make in the city? That rather is I've irrelevant. Never, that's such a childish question. Well, it's not, it's I've never childish. had anything to do with Davos, and I know that you've become a very left-wing broadcaster, but asking me lefty questions doesn't really get us anywhere. It's not a matter of left or right. It's it a matter is. of probing your position, I Mr. I've never had Eastmark. anything to do with Davos. Uh, no, no, all. but Davos, but Davos, Davos... I would imagine what you're suggesting by talking about Davos is a is sense of a man... of internationalism? Yes. I'm in favour of the nation-state, which was clear yes. from my speech, if you'd listened. I listened to every word you said, but I, it still seemed to me I listened extremely carefully, but it's possible and entirely appropriate that we try and probe We're some of the intellectual positions. Good, good. I mean, it's not but one of the problems... you seem to be re representing the left wing. Are you doing your bit of due impartiality you, that Ofcom requires Mr. you? Or are Mr. you right here as a left-wing broadcaster? Mr. Rees-Mogg, I know I'm that you're rather... I'm very interested in this, because this comes up with GB News, which I broadcast Which, on. of course, is completely impartial. Mr. Rees-Mogg... It meets the requirements of due impartiality, and well, I'm Well, according to Ofcom... Do. Mr. Rees-Mogg, I, I know I'm that you want to go on the attack, rather than talking about do, the do issue. Do you meet the requirements of if due you would impartiality? Allow to, absolutely, and do unlike... You? Unlike GB News, of so, course, so which is repeatedly... So you're putting a strong left-wing view. I'm not putting a strong left-wing view of anything. I'm simply trying to ask you and you interrogate you about some... No, well, not you seem to be. Well, according I, to I've your own people summary, waiting, so do, one more do question. Get it's the not point. one of the problems. Well, I would do if you allow me to actually for, to now ask a question. Now you're waffling again. Please get the point. Honestly, honestly, honestly. It is not one of the problems that conservatives such as yourself have started to go down a track where you're not willing to accept trade-offs. Yes, we could pull out of all of these institutions and organisations, but ultimately, there will be costs in so doing, just as there was with Brexit. And sometimes you start to talk about a world as you would like it to be, rather than the world as it is, which is exactly the sort of thing that Conservatives used to be very good at addressing. No, the Conservative Party has always been a practical party, and there are always trade-offs with doing one thing or another. But parties have to talk about ideas, otherwise they get nowhere. You seem to wish to live in an ideas-free zone. It's quite an extraordinary. An ideas-free zone? Not That's what you seem to be to arguing for. Anyway, you said that was the last question. Indeed. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Mr. Eastman. Thank you. So just two examples there of what happens when these people encounter proper journalists and two reminders of why they've now had to set up their own television stations because they dream of a world where broadcast media will look and sound like the Daily Telegraph comment pages currently look. I, I, listen, my job is just to warn you what's going to happen next. Thankfully, they probably won't be in power um, for a while, but the determination to create a world in which asking a question elicits an ad hominem attack, an accusation of, of political bias from somebody who works for an organization that is routinely found to be biased, to be uh, uh, breaking impartiality rules. This is Kafkaesque stuff, um, and some people want it to happen. So just a heads up. 18 minutes after 11 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Let's get stuck straight into the next. Oh, shout, no, all right, one more clip. No prizes for guessing who got the Stupidity of the Day award yesterday. Chopping trees down, we're growing trees and, and chopping them down, shipping them halfway across the world to put into a power station that used to take coal from a coal mine 10 miles away. And they say this, these wood pellets are sustainable because they're trees. We can grow them again. Now, I'm pretty sure that coal 100 million years ago was trees and plants. Is that right, Jacob? It was. So I would, I would argue that that's sustainable. <laughs> Are they laughing at him or laughing with him? You have to hope they're laughing at him, but perhaps they're laughing with him. So the idea there is that um, coal is sustainable because it, it's, I don't know, because it used to be trees. Okay. Um, I don't want to do a long introduction on this one, partly because I've taken up quite a lot of time giving you a quick glance at the, the reasons why the country is in the state that it's in, the kind of people who have risen to positions of power, including the last joker who de was deputy chairman of the Conservative Party until he resigned to vote against a bill that he ended up not voting against because when he went to vote against it, some people sniggled at him. That's the calibre of, of senior Conservatives now. Rhys Mogg, of course, still forgiven everything because he sounds as if he's got 17 plums in his mouth, which in this class-riddled country, some people people still mistake for intelligence but I don't know much about biology no I don't know much about the next story despite having spoken to it and spoken about it a million times with you over the years the independent office for police conduct is investigating a case in which a 16 year old boy was stopped by the police and searched on six separate occasions over a period of five months with nothing criminal ever found. We know that the power is used disproportionately against black people, especially young males. We know that elderly, white, right-wing, privileged people have absolutely no problem with that whatsoever. We also know that there was a brief little um, window 
when they almost got it. I don't know if you remember this during lockdown when people who were perfectly law abiding and doing absolutely nothing wrong could be stopped by the police and ordered to prove that they were innocent. So there were tales of, of women being stopped in the forest when they were merely drinking a coffee or, or, or heavy handed police um, insisting that people who'd just gone for a walk made their address clear and made, made do you remember that there was a little brief window where the police turned their attention to middle class promenaders and demanded that we prove that we were innocent of any crime despite there not being really any grounds to suspect us except the fact that we were guilty of being where we were do you, I don't know if you remember, we took a call from an amazing policewoman. She said, everybody loves the police until they're the ones being policed. I said two things to you during lockdown, which in retrospect look incredibly naive. The first was, I wonder whether furlough will make right-wing blowhards think a little bit more about state support for people. Now that they actually need state support and the government is providing it on a scale that would make the Russian Communist Party look... Um, uh, look on with envy. The government is pumping money into people's pockets in order to keep the country afloat. I wonder whether right ring blowhards will, after lockdown, after furlough, adopt a slightly different attitude to the notion of the state supporting people and institutions through tricky times. God, I sounded naive, didn't I? Do you, do you think these people who are currently trousering huge sums of money during furlough will come back and be a little bit nicer about people who are temporarily unemployed? Yeah, dream on, James. And the other thing I thought might change is that when all of these right-wing blowhards got on their very, very high horses about the police insisting that middle-class white people who've gone out for a walk prove that they're innocent of breaching lockdown laws, maybe they'll adjust their attitude to stop and search a bit and realise that actually it's not perfectly fair to do it because of the ethnicity of the person being stopped and searched once you've had some experience of being ordered by the police to prove that you're innocent um will you be less comfortable with the idea of other people being ordered by the police to prove that they're innocent and the answer again is no which is part of the reason why we are where we are today with this story. Seven officers being investigated for potential gross misconduct and one for mere misconduct. If they're found guilty, they could be sacked. Uh, that would suggest, wouldn't it, that it is the same officers targeting the same boy for whatever reason. One stop took place outside his mother's house, another outside his grandmother's house, another in a chicken shop, another by Tottenham Hotspur Station. And on not one of these six occasions in five months was anything criminal ever found. So the accusation would clearly be that it is being used as a tactic of aggression against an entirely innocent young man. So what's that like? 23 minutes after, uh, after 11. The, the, the question is pretty straightforward, okay? As a young black person being disproportionately targeted by the police when you are guilty of nothing, what effect do you think that had on you? That's the conversation I want to have. I don't want to hear from white people who once got pulled over by the police for having a broken windscreen wiper and therefore think there's absolutely nothing wrong whatsoever with a 16-year-old kid being stopped six times in five months. I want to hear from people who were routinely stopped for being black in Britain in the 20th and 21st century, and I want to help, I want you to help me understand what that does to you what that does to your relationship with society, to your relationship with your peers, and crucially to your relationship with the police. Because one of the great mysteries of our time, one of the great mysteries of our time is, well, for, for you know, smug middle-class white people like me who look on in confusion, is why a certain type of crime receives so little assistance from a community when the police start investigating it. Uh, the you know the, the notion of being a grass goes back to the days of the Cray twins and beyond. But we know that the police, when they're investigating perhaps the killing of a black teenager, cannot rely upon the same levels of cooperation from that teenager's community that those of us on the outside looking in would expect to be a, a natural progression. So what I want you to tell me is what it does to you, what it does to your relationship with the police, with society, or your attitude to 
to life in general. That's all. Okay, hit the numbers now. You will get through. 0345 973 is the number to call. The, 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 the crucial word here is disproportionate. Everybody um, adjacent to power for the last 14 years and quite possibly beyond has been perfectly comfortable with the idea that because there are uh, certain types of crime are disproportionately committed by people from certain types of background, therefore everybody from that type of background um, can be called upon to prove that they are innocent. And the madness of that, the, the, the blithe way in which that opinion is shared on radio stations and TV stations and newspaper columns is absolutely extraordinary. And every now and then the Daily Mail will find a black person to come forward and get paid to write about how they're completely comfortable with this idea, despite the fact that it's never happened to them. Or perhaps they'll even hit the jackpot and find a black person who has been stopped and searched, despite being completely innocent, to write about how they're perfectly comfortable with the practice because it's the only way that, I don't know, sense will ever be seen. But pause for a minute. If you need help getting it into focus, as a listener rather perhaps than a contributor, think about lockdown. Think about the absolute outrage that accompanied the idea of a completely innocent and blameless middle-aged woman being stopped by the police while going out for a walk in a woods with a friend and being called upon to prove that she wasn't breaking lockdown laws. And ask yourself why there would be outrage about that when some people will be queuing up already to argue that stopping a 16-year-old six times in five months with nothing criminal ever being found stopped, it would seem, by the same officers on the same patch of North London, well, that's absolutely necessary. And that young man should really just realise that this is a contribution that he's making to the betterment of society as a whole. So what does it do to you? What does it do to you? Um... And if the minute that the Metropolitan Police is, is found repeatedly to be guilty of institutional racism, then we'll talk about white people being stopped and searched as well. But we're discussing two words here, three words really, disproportionate and institutional racism. So I, I can't really explain that anymore clearly if you're, uh, I, I'm just having a quick glance at Idiot's Corner. It, it, when the Met is institutionally racist against white people, there'll be a conversation to be had about the impact that the examples of that institutional racism has upon the victims of it, champ. Until then, we'll conduct the conversation in this fashion. Eight officers. Investigation after a black child was stopped six times in five months. What will that have done, in your opinion, in your opinion, because you can't know, you're not a mind reader and you're probably not a psychologist either. What will that have done to that child, to that 16-year-old, 15-year-old, presumably, when it started? Hit the numbers now, you will get through. 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. And I think what I need to stress is that for you, it's, it's relatively normal. Do you know, 20 years ago, this probably wouldn't even have been referred to the uh, Independent Office for Police Conduct. What I'm conscious of, and this is what white privilege sounds like, I have no idea what that would be like. Absolutely no idea at all. If I were to make excuses for right-wing blowhards claiming that it's absolutely fine, they do so not necessarily from a position of callousness. They do so from a position of really weapons-grade ignorance. You have no idea what that would be like. So I imagine being stopped by the police and searched, despite the fact that I've done absolutely nothing wrong. And I think, well, that's fine. I'll empty my pockets and I'll go on my way. And I probably won't ever have another encounter with a police officer again, unless I'm the victim of crime. But six times in five months or twice in a year or 10 times in your 20s? I mean, that, that is something that is utterly incomprehensible to those of us who haven't gone through it. And so that's why I want a little bit of help in understanding the impact that it has, the difference that it makes. And you may not even know. You, you may only sort of work it out when you look back and think to yourself, actually, do you know, if, I, if I'd never ever been stopped and searched despite a, not, not having done anything wrong, I'd probably feel very differently about the police in particular and about my society in general as well 0345 6060 973 is the number you need thomas watts is here with your headlines 
It's 11.33. Um, I, one from Paul, who's listening, and then one from Keith, who's a mate of mine. Not that Keith, a different Keith. Paul writes, I'm a black man in my 60s, qualified as both a barrister and a solicitor, but my interaction with the police as a young man has profoundly impacted upon my negative view of the police, both personally and professionally. This view is highly unlikely to change as the negative and unfair interaction with the police persists with the younger generation. My mate, it defines who you become sometimes. Uh, it defines who you become, James, sometimes for the better, much of the time for the worst. I was first stopped when I was 12. I was in my school uniform, shorts, blazer, on my way home after going to Dewhurst's for my mum. You can tell he's my age. Uh, a policeman ran up to me, accusing me of robbing Ratner's. Ratner's was a jewellery chain, um, which was on most high streets in the United Kingdom until a quite extraordinary example of self-sabotage was undertaken by the then head of the family company, Gerald Ratner. They threw the meat on the floor and ripped up the 2000 AD comic that I had bought with the change. It was the first of many such stops, but I still remember that one as that was the moment I realised how many police see people like me. Keith obviously is black. I'm sometimes told I have a chip on my shoulder, but if I do, it was that policeman who used the first chisel on it and hopes that these days were behind us, perhaps diminished if not dashed by news today that eight metropolitan police officers are under investigation after a black child was stopped six times in five months. Just imagine it with your child coming home. I've been stopped by the police again today. Just imagine it, just for a minute, if you can. That's all. And hopefully by 12 o'clock today, when PMQs will be underway, don't forget, that should be a good one today. I wonder if Keir Starmer will bring up that disgusting bet that Rishi Sunak accepted. I don't know. We shall see at 12-ish. Um, by 12 o'clock today, you won't have to imagine what it's like. Rob's in Brixton. Rob, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello, um, yeah, this is, um, this, is, this is one quite close to the bone for me, um, especially as uh, it, it, it does quite outrageous that six times in five months wasn't uh, is, is a lot still um, still I'm, going on i think 20 years ago we wouldn't have been that shocked would we by that that, that statistic but well yeah i'm i'm 36 and that's what i've uh black from brixton i've right. lived in brixton my whole life um and it's yeah it's not it wasn't a lot back then that was perfectly normalized i got searched that many times in in two months, in one, in one month, and on one occasion, by the same copper who used to come around and just and grab us, because um, he could. I think the yeah, uh, well, well, we will never, we'll, we'll never know. I mean, sometimes it was different ones, sometimes it was the same one. Mm. Um, we put in a complaint about it eventually, or some of our parents did, and um, he, he just got moved on to um, onto a, into a different borough or something. They just moved the problem away. What does it do to you? To what does it do to you? Well, that's that's the other thing I wanted to um, mm. co contextualise because um, co coming up in the nineties in Brixton, there was a lot of there was a lot of gangs around. I mean, there's still there's still some, but it was it was feral back in those days. Um, and yeah, we used to go out with our skateboards and whatever, and and we'd be scared of a gang jumping out of a jumping out of a corner, or pulling up in a car, sticking up us against the wall, and going for our pockets. Um, that's exactly what the coppers were doing. Mm. Um, so there was essentially two gangs in that in our area. Oh, um, wow. um, uh, yeah, it's just one of them gave you a receipt after they after they went for your pocket. <laughs> and um, presumably didn't yeah. keep anything they found that they that they quite like the look of. I'm not being. They didn't glib. find anything. They didn't find it. No, I, I know they didn't find me. anything. Yeah, but yeah, I, if the gang had done yeah. it to you, they might have kept your pocket money or something like that. Which yeah, kept, they kept. Yeah, they were going for the phones. Yeah, they kept. Yeah, they kept the kept the phones. Sure. But. Um, uh, yeah, it was it was, the, it was the same fear. I guess that's what I'm getting at. It's the same apprehension. It's the same trepidation about leaving the house and like that's thinking, okay, what's you know what's going on, um, and it just leaves you with the idea. I mean, you, you, I'm not going to call on a gang for help if I get in trouble or if, if, no, if I course. see some trouble or something like that. But I'm I'm expected to call the police if there's if there's a problem. I mean, men my age, black men my age, but the last thing we do is call the police unless we absolutely have to because we're scared. Like there is a fear that well, this could go the wrong way. This could end up on me. Um, you know, I mean, if I say something wrong, if I if I'm too angry about this, I got hit by hit by a car off my bike, and I, I got shoved to the ground by the copper and told to shut up and go home because I was too angry about being hit off my bike. Really? Um, yeah, they, they, I was I was livid. I wasn't screaming, but oh. I was I was pretty upset that this guy, this driver, had, you know, so you can't, my bike. regardless of what you do with your life or where you go, you can't move on from the place where the police were a threat to you. 
The only thing they still are, like I say, I'm, I'm a professional 36 year old man. I, I work in the NHS in healthcare. Um, you know, I, you know, I do everything. I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not in any way involved in anything that would make you, um, you know, curl your toes. But I, but I am looking at the at the police in the same way as a criminal would, like looking out for them. Yeah. So that's what it's trained me to do: is to be hyper aware of where are the police, what they're doing. <sighs> am I okay? Um, have I, you know, um, and this I is a problem. How am I talking? What, what I'm trying to communicate today, with your help, is that this is a problem for all of us. You know, this is a pro- this is something that it's generational, isn't it? It's intergenerational. The, the police are supposed it, to yeah. police with consent, and they can't have your consent if you're fearful of them, if you see them as a threat. Well, it, it, and it does, you know, like if you, you know, most of the most of the police are are, are white. Most of them are men. It does reinforce this negative stereotype of of white men and cause uh, society to be more adversarial as well so like any hang-ups i have or any preconceptions i have about white people and white men that yeah. started with the police yeah that didn't start with like the white people as a whole have never done anything to me there's no reason for me to be wary or worry about white people based on personal experience historically maybe but <laughs> personal experience in, in my sphere in, in, in my world no so your That's earliest your, your earliest certainly your earliest negative encounters will be with police officers supposedly there to sort of uphold the law and, and knit society together they're leaving you on the outside of that equation uh, still yeah I will yeah you get resigned to the fact at some point in life and you go into adulthood and you, and you resign yourself to the fact that the police are for somebody else not for me you know what I mean? Well, that's I, the phrase. I've got to that's, deal with my own problems. that's the takeaway phrase. I don't know how you fix that, but you certainly can't even begin to as a society without acknowledging that it exists. You, you reach a point as a as a law abiding, upstanding citizen of this country that the police aren't for me; they're for others. Um, I, I, I'm getting into the habit of reading out a little bit more criticism than usual on the program. I don't think this is fair, Cab. Thank you, Rob. Take care. Um, A tiny correction for you, James. Yes, you are talking about white privilege, and thank you for doing it. But like many from your background, when finally getting that that's a big deal, you're also forgetting your class privilege. That's also a big deal in how the police treat. Give me a chance, will you? Honestly. I I always think the class privilege goes without saying. I mentioned I went to private school, right? I get 20 texts saying, why do you always mention you go to private school? Uh, I, I don't mention I go to private school when discussing an issue that might be linked to class or education. I get 20 texts saying, oh, well, what do you know? Why aren't you telling everyone you went to public school? Why aren't you telling... I can't win. So, yes, obviously, privilege, most obviously, privilege is class-based. But class and race are inextricably intertwined in so many ways. However, Cab, I am for you and you alone acknowledging that, that class privilege plays a part here as well. My middle-class background if I, if I, w- will have seen me come into contact as an innocent teenager with the police on many, many fewer occasions than it would have done if I'd been from a poorer background, from a working-class background. In fact, the only times I ever came into contact with the police as a teenager were when I was as guilty as sin. I was absolutely banged to rights, and that, I suppose, is as it should be for everybody. Stephen's in Croydon. Stephen, what would you like to say? Good morning, and thank you for taking my call this morning. You're very welcome. Um, yeah, so basically, I'm 30, 30 years old. I uh, currently work for the RAC. Yeah. Um, and so basically, uh, working obviously as hard as I can, getting as much money as I can, decided to treat myself to a nice car. Mm. I had a Mercedes. Um, and basically, long story short, um, I was pulled over in Croydon. Um, I was told that I was speeding when I wasn't. Um, I'm not known to the police, never have done. I work a good job. RAC is quite a high profile job, so yes. I would never risk something like that. Um, so it in death and all, they pulled me over um, within half, basically they boxed my car and pulled up in front of me, boxed the car in like I was sort of a massive criminal. Yeah. Um, I'm a white English guy, by the way, born sure. and raised in South London, many friends that deal with problems with the police day in, day out. Um, so yeah, they pulled me over, boxed the car in, halfway out the car, I had one foot out the car, they managed to put one set of handcuffs on the right wrist, one set of handcuffs on the left wrist, pointed a taser at my face. Um, so obviously at that point I was really, really scared at this point. I was like, I've seen videos on the internet of people getting tasered and stuff. And I was absolutely pooing myself at this point. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so they dragged me to the side of the road, said to me that it's a high drugs area. There's been a fight by KFC. Two people have made off on foot. Um, they think I'm involved. Um, they went for my car, searched my car, searched me, found nothing. Obviously I was still in my work clothes. Um, in uniform, in uniform. Yeah, I was still in uniform. Yeah. Gosh. 
And um, so, yes, I said to them, I said, guys, like, after about 10 minutes of them searching, my client searching me to prevail that they found nothing. I mean, if you um, were so, a criminal, you probably wouldn't do it in your work uniform, would you? Exactly, yeah. As it goes. Exactly my point. Um, so I said to them, I said, obviously, guys, like, it's been about 10 minutes now. There's six of you. Um, you've realised I'm no longer a threat. Could you please remove the handcuffs? Mm. No, it will stay on until we've searched your car and finished the search. And I was like, OK, I see where this is going. Um, I said, and they finished the search, removed the handcuffs. They said, oh, by the way, for speeding and not wearing a seatbelt, you're getting six points. And I was like, I, I was wearing my seat. No, you wasn't. And you was definitely speeding. And I said, how can you prove my speed? Yeah. Uh, you were speeding. You was going at extreme speed. And I was like, wow, OK. So I let them do what they needed to do. I took a picture of all four of their badge numbers. I took the day off of work the following day. I had to call in sick Go on. Um, to the police station straight away. Made a formal complaint against all the officers. Uh, a couple of few weeks later, I got a report back from the police. All four officers contradicted each other. They tried telling me that I was lying about them pulling out a taser, even though one of the officers stated that he pulled out his taser. Well, they'd have, would they have body cams as well? Or, or yeah, I've to... got the footage on disc at home. Go on, I don't want to hurry you, but I have to admit. <laughs> no, that's Go on. fine. It's not a problem. So, yeah, so basically they, they said that, we're giving you six points. And I was like, wow, I was like, I, I haven't done anything. There's like, no, nope, yeah, you were speeding, this, that, the other. Um, basically, all in depth, I was at a set of traffic lights, pulled through the set of traffic lights, and then that's when they pulled me over and boxed me in. So on the report, it said one of the officers said that I was stationary at a red light. The other officer said that I went through the red light at extreme speed. The other officer said that they were chasing me down the road. Um, and then, so obviously, I'm looking to possibly sue them, but I know by doing that, I'm probably going to put a strap against my back. Um, but realistically, of this, why I want to do it is just because of how they treated me. Most of the time when I was pulled over before as a younger lad, I've rid a lot of motorbikes through my time. So um, I've dealt with the police before. Most of the time, they sort of pull over, yes, sir, no, sir. They sure. not tend to let you go most of the time. But, but something this about this very, encounter was just a little bit, well, not a little bit. It was so heavy-handed that it wouldn't... Um... You couldn't just keep your head down. And also, there's are sticking you in handcuffs straight away. I, that, that, I mean, it is extraordinary, the way you describe it. And I don't, unlike you, I don't know what the right course would be. You'd have thought, if they're all contradicting each other about what actually happened at, at, the, at the roadside, then whoever is in charge of looking at your complaint might have concluded that they probably can't be trusted on uh, the reasons that they've given for, for pulling you over in the first place. Stephen, thank you. It's 11.46. It's 11.49, PMQ's on the way. It's, uh, I, 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 it's a weird political landscape at the moment. I interviewed Ed Davey yesterday for, for this week's Full Disclosure. I think it's this week's. Um, he's, he's, I, I tell you what, you, you, you need to listen to that interview. He's not like other politicians, Ed Davey. I, I've had him on the show in the last couple of weeks to talk about the um, uh, post office scandal and, and his, his role in it, somewhat exaggerated by... Um, conservative politicians and right-wing media. But but nonetheless, he addressed all of those criticisms on the show. So we didn't go into that. The Full Disclosure podcast, very much a life and times. And there might be some elements of Ed's life that you're aware of, but my goodness me, that man has lived. He's lived a life. And uh, and, and we explore it in some depth in, in, in Full Disclosure. But I was talking to him about a sense of disengagement at the moment, before the story today about the millennials being less likely to vote, uh, that story hadn't appeared. I just mentioned it to him in the context of what we're finding on, on, on the show at the moment. And he used that phrase, tuned out. He said, yeah, we, we, people seem to be tuning out a bit. I'm fascinated by that um, because politics is about to get very interesting again with a general election on the horizon and PMQs just, just 10 minutes away. So tune in, which is, of course, not only a phrase for radio but also the opposite of tuning out be sure to tune in uh, uh on pmqs i wouldn't even know where to start i know what i'd do if i was keir starmer but i don't think i have ever correctly predicted what keir starmer has done at pmqs by imagining what i would do if i was the leader of the labor he's not and that's probably a great credit to keir starmer he's not once done what i think i would have done in his shoes but i i would i would have thought he'd go near that bet he went in on, he's gone in quite hard on um, the immigration stuff lately. And that bet that, st what's his job, Sunak made with the television presenter, Piers Morgan. I, I, I mean, you'd have to use that, wouldn't you, as evidence of him being all manner of awful. I don't know. We shall see. Um, before that, back to the question of what it does to you, being stopped and searched routinely. Routinely, in ways that people like me with my white privilege and my class privilege can only imagine. Uh, Joseph's in Southwark. Joseph, what would you like to say? 
Hi, um, I'd just like to say very shortly that I, I think being stopped and searched routinely, it has more of an effect in a mental aspect of things. Go and I'm, I've, I've listened to what your um, previous callers have said, and I can only agree with what they've said. But for me personally, I think it's a correlation that I've found to carry on into my work life and I can pull back into the days of school because once again, we're being um, oppressed by an authority who unfortunately tends to be a certain kind of crease and a certain kind of sex, which is generally a white male. And you, you, you tend to understand that moving on in life, you become a threat to these kind of people. And I guess I'm not sure if it's because they find you a threat or it's a case of they just want to keep you down. So you can't progress past them. But I think mentally, um, that's something that I've suffered from. And I'm quite surprised that being stopped six times in six months has hit the news lines because... we naming people on, on air. Like no, I, do, I do apologise. Do that's OK. I think I managed to lose that. But we, we, we can't... I mean, it's no criticism of you, but he's not here to defend himself. And I sense that no. you were about to uh, possibly call his good name into, into question, Joseph. So yeah, carry on I mean, with with this anonymous police officer. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this this is just a general action that we used to um, experience quite a lot of the time. I remember very vividly one time running to the train station and being stopped after just leaving my house and being told that I was running from a crime and I smelled like cannabis. Right. And I said to the officer, "Is it a decision of I'm running from a crime or I smell like cannabis?" And when he said I smoke like cannabis, I said, how did you get to this conclusion with your window wound up? <laughs> but once again, it's just an opportunity to stop and search people. And I guess... Well, it's used as a... I mean, it almost sounds like a hobby. It sounds like something that would happen when they were bored. And, and, and also, there's a sort of power hungriness in, in, in what, what we hear on, on, in conversations like this, a sense that they're just proving power over somebody, which leads you to then, I think inevitably, especially if it's happening during your formative years, you associate white male authority figures with threat rather than protection or rather than authority even. Most definitely. But granted, I, I must say that this, this perception has been changed alongside working with people with a, a much more safer and open environment where you can see the, the nicer sides of people. And at the same time, I guess I'm at an age now where common sense is kicked in and I do understand police in one sense do have a job to do and they do have numbers to hit. Yes. And in the other sense... Um, it might not be the easiest thing to do, but I guess as humans, we're all prone to cut corners and make mistakes. And I guess <laughs> not that I justify it, but I can understand it. And I guess having an understanding for something allows you to be a lot more at ease with it. It doesn't mean I'm comfortable with it, but I can understand the process. That's a, that that's a, I love that. It's a very generous analysis, but also it's good for your mental health, isn't it? Not not to be harboring yeah. the, the, these sort of un, unaddressed grievances. and and Because not every police officer stopping a, 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 a young black man a black boy on the streets of london is engaging in an act of of oppression or or even an act of racial profiling it, as you say it will it will be necessary in in cases but the it's the it's the it's it's the plurality isn't it it's the six in five months it's that you thinking that's normal and me thinking it's shocking that that just shows that living in the same city in many ways we live in different worlds and I guess um, in, in correlation to the class aspect that I've yes. brought to this conversation, I think when you look at the locations of where people are being stopped, as for myself, South East, South West London, Brixton, Peckham, or if we're looking at East London or, or North, North London, Tottenham, we have to understand that there is a higher density of black population people as opposed to other ethnic colours, but it still doesn't um, justify or Yeah, but mate, you know, you know that you never, get, you never get picked up by your ankles outside Bougie's nightclub in South Kensington to see what falls out of your pockets it just doesn't happen so you know you have there, there are questions of prop proportionality and ethnicity but this is where class kicks in almost as hard as race uh, you know the amount of cocaine knocking about the nightclubs of southwest london would uh, be enough to put a colombian cartel to shame and yet you never hear stories of people uh, walking up the king's road at four o'clock in the morning being stopped and searched on uh, on the suspicion of the smell of cannabis so make of that what you will thank you joseph uh, probably the last word on this with PMQs just um, uh, preparing itself for our attentions around the corner. Lucian's in Waltham Cross. Lucian, what would you like to say? Hi there, James. Hello, mate. A very, really good topic because I think it's something which we, um, as from the black community, doesn't necessarily get to explain ourselves. Yeah. <clears throat> how it is. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's quite all so right. Was... Do you want a tissue? <laughs> 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 I'm okay. Cheers. Right. Thank you. Right. So, um... Everything that was mentioned by all your callers, my, me, myself, I've experienced. I'm 44 years of age. Um, my youthful time was in the 90s and the noughties. Yeah. 
And so everything that they've said that the callers have, sp- have spoken about, I've experienced, and even more so. Now, I lived in more, I live in Waltham Cross. I went to school in Cheshunt, which is on the borders of Hertfordshire, North London. Now, my mum moved out of Edmonton, and they moved out of Edmonton with my dad back in in the in the eighties because there was a big super. They, they called it the Super Nick was being built in Edmonton. Right. And what the police were doing, they was actually arresting the young, um, pulling the young school black school boys, which were going to primary school and going through their packed lunches to see mm. if they had drugs. Right. These are primary school children. My mum's from the East End, so she said, well, okay, time to leave. Yeah. Because she's had very experiences back in the 60s with the police, because we know the police were very notorious with their racism back then. So we moved up to Hertfordshire, um, right on the edge of North London, or from Cross, went to school in Cheshire, predominantly white. And I'm going to have to hurry you. I'm getting the autobiography, Lucian, which is fascinating, but we've got... But Keir Starmer isn't going to wait for you to finish before he gets to his feet in the house of (laughs) gone. Fair enough. The bottom line is is that what we experience, what we experience um, in the black community or being black... But what does it do to you when you're stopped and such for no reason, quite regularly? No, it makes you paranoid. It makes you angry as well. Yeah. And so straight away, sometimes people, straight away, you have this... um, you, you, You go into an aggressive mode. Sometimes it's just yeah. natural, you know. So straight away, that can be obviously um, counter counteractive for yourself. Not a very good thing. But yeah. straight away, because you're constantly you're always paranoid, always on your back foot, and then you're angry because it happens so many times. That can escalate somewhere else. Yeah. But the bottom line is, it makes you continually paranoid. You don't trust the police. You're in your car. You're always worried. You don't you can't really go to the police because really you see them as being the enemy. Yeah. So you so you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. You catch a dream. Well, don't just catch it. It's crystal clear. This is and, and this this so this uh, this is so important because it, it leaches into every area of your life. You're describing a form of hypervigilance, like like you're always adrenalized. You're always in fight or flight mode. You're always on your guard because the people who are supposed to protect you have cast themselves as threats. You are, and then when you go into predominantly white areas with myself, a lot of my mates are white, and so on and so on. Sure. Going to school and other places, going to workplaces, all of a sudden you you just automatically every white male is you're you're, you're always on your back foot. I, I haven't. Well, you know, I've had a few conversations, many conversations over the years, uh, and I always try to ask a slightly different question uh, about stop and search. We've never come in on that angle before. You and Joseph and other callers describing a, a sort of a, a, a leeching of perception from the from the police officers who've unfairly and unreasonably stopped and searched you into into everybody of a similar ethnicity which you recognize as you describe it is both unfair and unhelpful but I, I'm so grateful to you and to Joseph and to everybody else for being so honest and, and because that's a problem for everybody that's a problem for everybody for the whole of society and it's not a problem that's contained to the kids that are being stopped and searched unfairly and still in 2024, it would seem very, very regularly. Lucian, I gave you fair warning. Have we got time, Natasha Clark, to make any predictions about what is likely to happen today? I can run you through my list very quickly. You've made a I? list, have you? I'm checking it twice. Go on then. Um, well, obviously, we've had the sad news about the King's cancer diagnosis this week. Um, I wonder if I were Keir Starmer whether I would be using it to batter the government on their terrible well, NHS just to, record. Just to, I mean, as the Daily Mail says today, the left just can't wait to politicise King's Cancer. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really sorry to politicise the King's Cancer. Yes, if you would sorry, if mind I would. I not go, talking I about go. cancer in the context of anybody else but, while also acknowledging what great service the King's diagnosis has done course, in helping everybody else. I will be only else. a true patron, only Thank say you. good things about the government. Yes. Um, I, I think, you know, you cannot fail to... To, to open up a conversation once you start talking about this. You know, the King obviously and rightly should be uh, allowed access to the best medical um, care in the country that he can get. Of course, he's the King. I th- personally think that's what he should uh, be entitled to. But it will raise the question for millions of people who are waiting on waiting lists, trying to get mm. proper cancer diagnosis. So many targets being missed in the NHS for cancer. We have uh, dropped down the league tables in many uh, cancer areas um, in terms of detecting it, in terms of getting help. And we know that in the most poor and deprived parts of the country, that's even worse. And I think that's a good way. I, like I say, will, will Keir Starmer go on it? Because like I say, will he then be accused, oh, you're politicising an issue? Potentially that's something that he would be alive to, of well, course. Increasingly, but... he's going to have to live with... Well, hang on, we'll find out, shall we? Thank you, Mr Speaker. I join with the Prime Minister in sending His Majesty the King our very best wishes for his treatment across this House. We all look forward to seeing him back to full health as quickly as possible. Mr Speaker, this week the unwavering bravery of Brianna Jay's mother, Esther, has touched us all. 
As a father, I can't even imagine the pain that she's going through, and I'm glad that she's with us in the gallery here today. Mr Speaker, a year ago, the Prime Minister promised to bring NHS waiting lists down. Isn't he glad he didn't bet a grand on it? Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, at least I stand by my commitments. He's so so indecisive, the only bet he'd make is an each way bet. Well, Mr. Speaker, he says he's. He stands by his commitments. He once insisted, insisted that if he missed his promises, these are the words he used, I'm the Prime Minister, and then he said, it's on me personally. Today we learn from his own officials that he's the blocker to any deal to end the doctor's strikes. And he's always, every time he's asked, he blames everyone else. So what exactly did he mean when he said, it's on him personally, if he doesn't meet his promise? Minister. Mr Speaker, well, we are bringing the waiting list down for the longest waiters for making progress, but it's a bit rich, Mr Speaker, to hear about promises from someone who's broken every single promise he was elected on. I mean, I think I counted almost 30 in the last year. Pensions, planning, peerages, public sector pay, tuition fees, childcare, second referendums, defining a woman. Although, although, in fairness, that was only 99% of a U-turn. The, the list goes on, but the theme is the same, Mr Speaker. It's empty words, broken promises and absolutely no plan. Of all, of all, the, work, of all the weeks to say that, when Brianna's mother is in this chamber, Shame. Parading as a man of integrity when he's got absolutely no responsibility. Absolute. Of all. But either side. I, I think the member's getting carried away. Can I just say that our constituents want to hear the questions and they certainly want to hear the answers. They don't want to hear organised barracking. So please, I want no more. Keir Starmer. I think the role of the Prime Minister is to ensure that every single citizen in this country feels safe and respected. It's a shame the Prime Minister doesn't share that. I welcome the fact that he's finally admitted that he's failed on waiting lists in the NHS. I also welcome that he's finally acknowledged the crisis in NHS dentistry. He's calling it a recovery plan after 14 years of Tory government. What exactly does he think the NHS dentistry is recovering from? As, as ever, Mr. Speaker, he, he seems to convene. Certainly not have enough of the front bench either. Please, I want to hear it. The election fever, I'm hoping, is not coming tomorrow, so let's not behave as the it is, Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, as ever, he conveniently forgets the impact of a pandemic on NHS dentistry, and it was specifically because of the close proximity nature of dental provision that it was unable to operate as normal throughout the pandemic. That was the recommendation of the medical and clinical experts, Mr Speaker, which is why inevitably there is a backlog in dental care and the impact that it has. But that's why, as the Honourable, my Honourable Friend, the Health Secretary, will outline later today for the House, we're putting more funding in to provide more NHS provision across the country, on top of plans that will see the number of dental training places has increased by 40%, Mr Speaker. But I would actually just point out, our plans mean that there will be two and a half million more NHS appointments, which is in fact three times more than the Labour Party are proposing. Mr Speaker, there are some areas in the country where you literally can't have an NHS dentist. And he says that's down to Covid. People are literally pulling out their own teeth. Sorry. Can I just say... I don't need any more off this front bench either. Do we understand each other? Carry on, please stop. Speaker, people are literally pulling their teeth out using pliers. It's an experience that can be compared with extracting an answer from the Prime Minister at this dispatch box. 
The truth is, after 14 years of neglect, this recovery plan is just a desperate attempt to try to recover back to square one. If he wanted to move forward, he should follow Labour, scrap the non-DOM tax status, use the money to fund two million more hospital appointments every year. But, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister is oddly reluctant to follow us on this. What exactly is so special about this tax avoidance scheme that the Prime Minister prioritises it above the NHS? Well, Mr Speaker, let's look at that record. We've in the NHS record funding, record doctors and nurses, record number of appointments, m- higher cancer survival rates. But what's happening under Labour's watch in Wales, Mr Speaker? Let's have a look. A fifth, a fifth of people in Wales are currently on a waiting list. Waits of 18 months or more are ten times higher than that in England, and people are waiting twice as long for an operation. Their failure has sent the Welsh NHS back to square one, and will never let them do that here. Mr Speaker, when he admitted that he had failed on waiting lists, I actually thought that we might be entering a new era of integrity, professionalism and accountability. (laughs) Remember that one? But just like all the other relaunches, it's proved to be a false dawn, still blaming everyone else, still removed from reality. It's very simple. You can either back more NHS appointments or more tax avoidance. We know what side we're on. Why doesn't he? Mr Speaker, the best way to ensure that we continue to fund the NHS, as we have, is not to make £28 billion of unfunded spending commitments. And just this morning, independent Treasury officials have published a formal costing of just one part of their eco-promise, their insulation scheme, and it turns out that it will cost double what they had previously claimed. Not the £6 billion that Labour accounted for, but £13 billion every single year. It's now crystal clear they have absolutely no plan, but we all know how they're going to fund that gap. More taxes on hard-working people. Mr Speaker, this is Mr 25 tax rises. He, he's literally the country's expert on putting taxes up, and he thinks he can lecture everyone else on the economy. Last week, he and his MPs were laughing at someone whose mortgage had gone up £1,000 a month. This week, he's casually made a £1,000 bet in the middle of an interview. Last week, he thought even raising questions about the cost of living was, and I quote, resorting to the politics of envy. And this week, he's finally found the cause that he wants to rally around the non-DOM status. When he finds himself backing tax avoidance over NHS appointments, does he start to understand why his own MPs are saying he simply does not get what Britain needs? Mr Speaker, I'm not going to take any lectures about getting... About, about getting Britain from a man who thought it was right to defend terrorists, Mr Speaker. But what we're doing is building a brighter future for our country. In just the last week, expanding health care in pharmacies. Today, expanding dental care. This week, helping millions with the cost of living. And most importantly, cutting national insurance. All while the, all while the Labour Party argue over 28 billion different ways to raise people's taxes. That's the difference between us. We're delivering a plan. They can't even agree on one. My constituents and I send our best wishes to the King and Royal Family. Mr Speaker, despite the popular narrative, our economy is doing well with an unemployment rate with an with an unemployment rate well below the EU average, strong inward investment and record employment. Taxes are higher than Conservatives would like, but does my right honourable friend agree that a key reason for this is that we rightly spent £400 on Covid support, including one of the most generous furlough schemes, in order to ensure that no one got left behind and that it is our intention and instinct to lower taxes, unlike the parties opposite. 
Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is right to highlight our record of providing support to the country when it needed it, whether it's the NHS, vaccines or furlough during Covid, or most recently help with people's energy bills. We're only able to afford that because of the strong management of our economy, which is why we must stick with the plan, not risk going back to square one with the Labour Party, who, as we know, have absolutely no plan and will cost everyone in this country with their £28 billion worth of tax rises. Leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I begin by expressing my heartfelt sympathies to Brianna's mother, who is in the public gallery as we speak, and also to send my best wishes to King Charles in what will hopefully be a quick and full recovery. Mr Speaker, the public are used to the Tories gambling on the lives of others. Yeah. Boris Johnson, he did it with public health during the pandemic. His immediate successor, she did it with household finances. So not to be outdone, the Prime Minister on Monday this week accepted a crude bet regarding the lives of asylum seekers. In doing so, he demeaned them as individuals and he degraded the office that he currently holds. So can I ask him, Will he apologise? Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, we may have a principal disagreement on this. I believe and we believe that if someone comes to this country illegally, they shouldn't be able to stay, they should be removed, and that's why we're committed to our Rwanda scheme. Stephen Flynn. Mr Speaker, as ever, the Prime Minister does himself no favours, because of course the bet to which we are referring was worth £1,000, and it came just hours before the Prime Minister ended cost of living support worth just £900. And his justification for doing so was that the cost of living crisis is easing. So can I ask him, what does he believe leaves him looking most out of touch with the public? Gambling £1,000 or believing that the cost of living crisis is getting better? Well, Mr Minister. Speaker, he talks about the cost of living. Perhaps he can explain to the Scottish people why it is that whilst the UK Conservative Government is cutting their taxes, the Scottish Government is raising them. Yeah. So, Mr. Mr Speaker, the thoughts of the people of East Worthing and Shoreham are with His Majesty as well. It, it is quarter past twelve. I um, didn't see that coming, did we? Um, even even with, with your list, and Natasha the Clark. COVID, but uh, can we turn this noise off in my ear, please? What, 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 thank you. That's uh, nice and quiet. Isn't is that it? better? Yeah, it's that's oh, phew. Oh, it's all over. Shh. If I ever did want to go into politics, it would be mostly so that I can just shout in the chat. Like, there's no other place of work where you can do that, is there? Except possibly the stock market. Can you still do that on the stock market? <laughs> Can't do that here. Here, here. Um, should we pick over the bones of that conversation shortly? But just to be clear. He, there's no way he knew that Esther Jai was in the chamber. Is I don't there? think he did. I, otherwise, I don't think he would have made that very quite crass remark about Keir Starmer not knowing what a woman is. If people he had people known that. would describe it as a transphobic joke, although of course with with, with any, it's not very taste. It's not no. tasteful. It's very tasteless to do so in in the presence of I, her. Yeah, as well. I, I, obviously, if 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 Keir Starmer had made a misstep of that magnitude in in the chamber, you could expect it to be on at least eight front pages tomorrow. But such is the nature of the British media that Rishi Sunak's probably all right. It's twelve fifteen. It is 18 minutes after 12. Uh, I, I think that's gross, actually. I, I, I really do. And I misspoke a moment ago. I, you know, I'm cursed, Natasha Clark, with um, a surfeit of kindness and generosity, even with political figures who I don't approve of or, or particularly agree with. I just presumed, in Rishi Sunak's defence, that he must have been utterly unaware that Esther Jai was in the public gallery before he tried a transphobic joke in the chamber, but it, it appears, and people listening to the programme are clearly paying rather more attention than I was to the programme I ostensibly present, mm. it appears that Keir Starmer did actually welcome her to the chamber before Rishi Sunak stood up and made his rather, I think you just coined the word crass. It's you know, crass. It's, it's tasteless, crass. isn't it? Is crass, crass. Crass. I'm a, I'm a posh girl, really. Crass. I've crass, never heard it called crass, crass before. Sorry. Crass, okay. crass. No, I think um, it's crass, but I like crass. Sure. Jacob Rees-Mogg probably says <laughs> crass, so there are at least two, there are at least two of you. 
in the oh, world. Um, but that's bad, right? Because it, A, it's no, going to distract. It well, I, I mean, it's probably bad for Starmer that it's going to distract from quite a good PMQs for him. But it puts Sunak in a very ugly box. It does. It's, it is. It's just. It's t yeah. It's tasteless, isn't it? To, to, and was he not listening to when I presume, Starmer Again, I'm it. doing that thing. I'm being too generous, perhaps. Look, I presume he didn't wasn't really concentrating because he was waiting to see what the thing he was going to sure. have to respond to would be. But usually, politicians are given the nod to important people that are in the chamber and his team should, Rishi Sunak's team should have known that, they should have told him before that, they should have briefed him. Did he then, you know, jump to a, a, an attack that he has obviously used in previous Prime Minister's questions yeah. um, and not think about it? Was it like an unscripted remark possibly or was he Because just not... he's used it before, it's one yeah, of his break used it glass. Before. Of course he's used it before and obviously Tory MPs usually cheer at that sort of thing and you know but yes it's a bit unclear about why he would have felt that this no, was but, an appropriate but, but what thing is clear, to say because i'm getting rinsed for it on my socials uh, on the inbox i did categorically get that wrong i just presumed he couldn't have whether he knew or not we don't know whether he noticed or not we don't know but he categorically it was said by kirsten in, in the chamber before that she was rishi there. sunak stood up we'll have a listen to it actually just to be absolutely clear and for anyone wondering why this is significant what you have is a young transgender woman being being murdered in part one of the motivations of one of her murderers was a hatred of transgender people mm -hmm. and Rishi Sunak very much appealing to the hatred of transgender people in the in the in the choice of I'm gonna have to use the word joke comment it was that, a joke that, that, that yeah. he yeah I mean that he elected to make so so here it is Mr Speaker this week the unwavering bravery of Brianna Jay's mother Esther has touched us all. As a father, I can't even imagine the pain that she's going through, and I'm glad that she's with us in the gallery here today. Yeah. Clear as day, isn't it? It is, but but possible that he didn't. He should have been listening. He was, yeah, clearly should and, have been listening, and you know. Should we listen to his to, to to the joke as well, just to be clear about about what, what's happened here? But it's a bit rich, Mr Speaker, to hear about promises from someone who's broken every single promise he was elected on. I mean, I think I counted almost 30 in the last year. Pensions, planning, peerages, public sector pay, tuition fees, childcare, second referendums, defining a woman. Although, although in fairness, that was only 99% of a U-turn. The list goes on, but the theme is the same, Mr Speaker. It's empty words, broken promises and absolutely no plan. Of all, of all the work, of all the weeks to say that, when Brianna's mother is in this chamber, shame, parading as a man of integrity, when he's got absolutely no responsibility. Absolute. Of all. I mean, it doesn't really matter whether she's there or not in the context of the of the comment, but the fact that she was is. Um I think that's just really sad and quite awful. It what, is, and just 24 hours ago, he was asked about her comments. Obviously, she's been on the media the last couple of days calling for under-16s to have different phones, with not to have social media apps on them, obviously because of the role that social media played a part in the tragic murder mm. of her child. Um, and, and, you know, Rishi Sunak was asked about this, and she, I think he said about just about 24 hours ago in another interview that she was an inspiration and that he, <laughs> you know, was really, um, you know, touched to hear her story and, um, you know, to, to, to make that joke just, just really comes across as terribly terribly tasteless and, and i suppose hopefully he'll stop now regardless of the the, the context or whoever is in yeah, there the were plenty gallery. of other examples well, of exactly. Keir Starmer changing his mind yes, which he exactly. could have pointed to and he obviously did but it really took the sting out of his argument there and i think he was very much on the back foot for the rest of those prime minister's questions because i think he realized instantly and he would have known mm. instantly oh no i've made a mistake yeah um the bet came up as we probably yes. expected yes this bet that the prime minister has um has was was i think it's fair to say pressured into uh by um piers morgan Morgan, um, uh, during an interview where he bet a thousand pounds that he would see the flights take off to Rwanda I think it was by the election um, and yes there are obviously uh, critics have pounced on this and I think you know Keir Starmer mentioning it um, obviously we saw Stephen Flynn mentioning it 
it does tap into this narrative of Keir Starmer saying, you don't get it. You just bet a £1,000 like nothing. You're rich. Um, and everybody else in the country doesn't quite understand how you can just frivolously bet this. And you mentioned this um, off air uh, that he made, a bet, he made a betting joke, didn't he? He said... Yes, um, he, he said in each way in each bet. Way he said, bet. He said, so either... I mean, we proved yesterday that he's, he's lying when he said he wasn't a betting man. He is a betting Not man. least because he's, he's a hedge funder, man. but also because he'd spoken to Test Mass Special in some depth about he all the fun he had on spread cricket betting. Before. Exactly. That's right. And he then says, yeah, well, I, I don't bet. I but you have to don't. be a betting can... person to know why it's I funny don't... to make a joke about an each-way bet. You can't, I can, I, even as a non-better, I can kind of understand it. But um, but it's not, a, it's, it's, not a, it's, it's not not a weak bet, an each-way bet. It's, I mean, you're basically saying you're going to get So is placed. that when you bet on bet, bet the same on both sides? No, is that it? no. Oh, it's okay. when you, get, you can't bet the same on both sides. Why not? Well, that's, but that wouldn't be an each-way bet. That would be two bets. I see. Two bets on the nose. What's an each-way bet? An each-way bet is when you're betting to win or to get placed. So you bet twice. So a £5 bet each way costs £10 and you win if you come first but then you win a smaller amount if depending on the race if you come second or third or right. in, in big races like the national fourth or fifth might be okay he, defi- he definitely well. knows more about betting than I do because I don't as know clearly that. do I yeah yes. clearly <laughs> that's not hard so, apparently. But, but to claim he's not a betting man was a pathetic attempt to wriggle <laughs> no. off the embarrassment of doing with Piers Morgan what he um fa- he what, what, failing to do with Piers Morgan what he did do with Nick Ferrari who oh, this is for Nick to account for who made exactly the same crass and mm. um and attention seeking offer of a, of a bet on something as serious as the Rwanda story a couple of years ago. I think, ago. you know, in, in the Prime Minister's defence, he is trying to say, I'm so, so confident in this. Yeah, yeah. I think he shouldn't have done it, but I think he will, he was trying to say, and I think he slipped up by obviously doing that and saying, yes, 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 I will. I think both of them said, yes, they would give it to a charity, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Sure. But yes, it, it doesn't look good. And I think it taps into that Keir Starmer narrative that he keeps on pushing. If this guy doesn't get it, he's rich, he doesn't understand your problems. And that is something we're going to continue to see in the run-up to the election. What else came up? Remind me. Um, obviously, the, the, what, what Rishi Sunak was able to be strong on in that Prime Minister's question, so I think the only thing I think he was strong on was the 28 billion round that Labour mm. just cannot seem to get away from. Do um, the public care about this, do you think? I think the public care about the issue of the environment. Yes. I think Labour have made it a huge part of their offering. Um, it's, it was obviously launched at their party conference, I think, two years ago now. It's been a very big part of their economic offer to the nation is that we're going to grow the economy by going green. We're going to spend this amount of money. They put the figure on it. Uh, and now they're getting themselves into knots about whether they will stick to this figure mm. of £28 billion. Yesterday, Sir Keir Starmer came out and said he would. Just last week, I think the week, maybe the week before now, Rachel Reeves on LBC refused to say that 28 billion figure. And that's a really strong argument for Rishi Sunak to make. Well, you've got you know two people on your front bench and you can't really make your mind about what your position is. If these guys want to go into government, they really need to get themselves sorted out. And for a lot of people, it is very important to know exactly. And for businesses, right? They're, Labour are trying to be the party of business. They need to show what they are saying is going to be what they are actually going to do in government. And there is clearly a big row within the Labour Party about whether to drop that figure or not. Mm. Um, And once again, Stephen Flynn sort of uh, filling in some of the spaces that Keir Starmer feels he can't go into. He would mention the bet as well, didn't he? Yes, he did. He did. So that again, that was a sort of different two sides of that. But yes, saying that they're, you know, he mentioned gambling. He said he conservatives gambling with lives, trusted it with the economy. Why is he now betting on an asylum seeker? And will he apologise? And I didn't hear a, a squeak of an apology from the Prime Minister uh, on that one uh, either. Something I thought Sir Keir Starmer might mention. I think he missed uh, an opportunity to talk about the Popcorns, your new favourite political party. Keir Starmer would have done that. I'm not surprised. He didn't do it, did no, he? No, but I don't know that you... I mean, what does he do? Because Rishi Sunak hasn't got any... Has he got any of, I mean, Link, these people really are his enemies. So, oh, so he could have in gone same, in on the division. He could in the same party as him. Could have quoted Henry Riley and, uh, and asked from yesterday's conference and asked how many factions are there currently in the country. That would be mm. quite a good question, actually. Yeah. We should submit these next week. We should. We should drop them off. Well, how many factions are there? And he could read if them all out. Five like we groups did plus at least this one. We right? think there's 12. You think that's 12? Well, okay. if you include things like the Northern Research Group. Oh, yes, there are many and the baby ER, factions. And the ERG, and there's a China yeah. Research, China. China Research Group. I see. So if you include all of them, there's na- new conservatives, I think. Yep. That's one, one of the five. Tories, yep, that's not, one Nation Tories, but they're not. So they're big group. One Nation yeah. Tories are big. They're just not, they're quite quiet. Powerless. Say. That's Damien Green and Chums. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So uh, uh, that would be a good. How many factions are there? There's a lot. The there's a lot. Yeah, the Conservative Party are a very divided uh, party, and you know the the. the 
the uh, argument is that divided parties don't win elections. It, there is a uh, line here that I've never heard before. I very much doubt that it is the original work of whoever has sent it in, and I can't find the text anyway, so I can't credit whoever sent it. Have you ever heard this before? Rishi Sunak is a shiver in search of the spine. Ooh. <laughs> Have you heard that before? No. Is that, I, I is, is that a quote from... I quite like that. No, it's a quote from Dave. Um, Lovely. Anyway, Thanks, and, and Mike in Sutton points out that Starmer was visibly shaking with rage at that by Sunak, um, although Gary reminds us that he is a barrister. But yeah, I do think actually, because if, if, if Brianna Jai's mum Esther is there as a guest of Starmer, mm. which seems quite likely given that he was the one to draw attention to her presence there. Yeah, perhaps. Perhaps he didn't know. Starmer would be, uh, would be actually offended, not, not just politically offended but yeah, personally he'd guest. be embarrassed yeah. that you mm-hmm. have insulted this woman who I have invited here to see to, to A to hear the Prime Minister pay tribute in a sense to your daughter and B to show you the workings and mm-hmm. how seriously we're taking your suggestions and then Mm-hmm. Rishi Sunak stands up and does a little mm-hmm. bit of mild transphobia. Yeah. Not a good week for him. No, and it was a very bitty Prime Minister's question, wasn't it? It was. It? It, was, it was just a lot of mudslinging and insults, and there wasn't really, nothing really seemed to take hold as a leading narrative. You know, we had mention of mm. dentists, labour in Wales, waiting lists, tax avoidance, spending. There was not one theme that, that the Prime Minister or Keir Starmer kept to throughout that. It was quite bitty, it was quite rowdy, it came across as a little bit fragmented, and I don't think there's anything. If you if you say to you know, the, the Joe public, what do you remember out of that Prime Minister's questions? I think it would struggle to to, to pull out a, a highlight or a low light from that one. I think that's a fair a fair account, a fair um, a fair roundup. Thank you very much, Natasha Clark. The time is twelve thirty one, and Amelia Cox has your headlines. I thought it was too good to be new, that shiver in search of a spine line. Paul Keating, apparently, the Australian politician, has used it. Um, According to the Oxford Dictionary of Quotations, Paul is a very erudite man, clearly, but Martin is possibly even better informed. He tells me that Harold Wilson described Edward Heath as a shiver looking for a spine to run up. That's beautiful. Come on, fans of language. That's a beautiful way of putting things. Now, something a bit strange has happened in the the corners of the media that we probably need to start talking about a bit more now that the American presidential election wheels are turning. You you know who Tucker Carlson is. Tucker Carlson has achieved the frankly extraordinary feat of becoming too foul for even Rupert Murdoch to tolerate. So he was once the most popular presenter on Fox News where he embarked enthusiastically and knowingly upon enthusiastic attempts to uphold, enforce and disseminate the lies that Donald Trump was telling about the last presidential election in America, the the depositions in the Dominion case, the manufacturers of the voting machines that were used in that election sued Fox News for gazillions of dollars, to use a technical term. And although they settled out of court for gazillions of dollars, the depositions that were submitted and that therefore made their way into the public space were extraordinary, including one lawyer asking Rupert Murdoch whether it was true that he didn't really care about red or blue, he only cared about green, which is a, a reference to the fact that the Republican Party is traditionally red, the Democrat Party is traditionally blue, and dollar bills are traditionally green. And and exchanges involving Tucker Carlson talking about how much he hated Donald Trump and his followers. Um, it, it, such is the nature of modern media that Donald Trump and, it, uh, well, certainly his followers, continue to revere Tucker Carlson even after it has been publicly revealed that he thinks they're scum. So where does somebody like Tucker Carlson go, having become persona non grata with... Even Rupert Murdoch, who obviously has people on his payroll who redefine disgusting on an almost daily basis. Answer, Elon Musk. So Carlson has managed to set himself up on Twitter, very much with Elon Musk's encouragement, and uh, and, and broadcast some sort of program on that platform, which are, on one sense, a multiplicity of media is a good idea, but if you are a proven liar who is known to do the bidding of a depraved politician with dictatorial ambitions, then in the interest of society itself, it's probably not such a good thing. But given that Elon Musk has recently taken to spouting versions of the so-called great replacement theory on the platform that he bought because he was desperate to be popular um, and continues to hemorrhage money supporting, we probably shouldn't be that surprised. So if, if if your dishonest and relatively disgusting support for Donald Trump has come to naught, where on earth would you go next? 
Who, where, where might Tucker Carlson push his chips on the poker table of political journalism next? And I use the word journalism very lightly. John Sweeney is an investigative journalist, well known to you, a former um, paragon of panorama and, and elsewhere at the BBC. He's also something of a, of a thorn in Vladimir Putin's side. His latest book, Killer in the Kremlin, gives you a fairly good idea of where John's feelings and indeed the observable, irrefutable facts lie. So Tucker Carlson is in Moscow to interview Vladimir Putin, John. Did you see this coming? Um well, he was in Moscow, and the moment uh, Tucker Carlson popped up, I thought, well, he's only there for one purpose, and that's to to lick the dictator's bottom. Can I say that? I just did. Um, so, oh, well, and, and, that's right. You book Sweeney, <laughs> you know what you're getting. <laughs> but he, um, he, he's, I read the transcript of the interview, yeah. um, which has popped up on Twitter, and it's awful. I mean... Uh, so, I mean, hopefully um, all of LBC's listeners will, will already get this, but let's just explain. Mm. If you commit journalism in the way that you do, James, or I do, in Russia, you may die. And I'm not saying that lightly. I know three people who um, were journalists. One of them was a journalist and a politician. But they were Anna Politivskaya, Natasha Esmerova, yeah. and Boris Nemtsov. Yeah. And in order... Uh, Anna was poisoned, then shot. Natasha shot. Boris Nemtsov shot. By the way, I'm in Amsterdam. Uh, I was attending a, a conference of Russian exile journalists uh, last night. So One will. of the people uh, who was talking is a woman called Maria, and she's the great lady who popped up on Russia Today with a sign oh, early yes. on in the war saying no war. And essentially, she was facing um, prison. She managed to escape Russia got out with her daughter, but she's left her son and her mum behind in in Russia, and and they're not talking to her. Her family is broken. So if you really, if you're a journalist and you stand up to Putin, you may die, or you may have to live in permanent exile. Mm. And Tucker Carlson gets a patsy interview. He never, as far as I can tell, has never once asked any questions that Putin would have any kind of trouble with whatsoever. This isn't journalism, it's propaganda. And uh, extraordinary to see a prominent, I mean, he's a household name in America. He's fairly well known on this side of the Atlantic. He was one of the most, if not the most popular presenter on cable news when he was still taking Rupert Murdoch's shilling. And yet, oddly, John, it doesn't feel that surprising. It feels that you're exactly um, on the money, uh, on the green, as the American, well, no, they won't say that. But, it feels like there is a, something like a fascist international which is growing and growing. So what you've got is Vladimir Putin, who is the master of it all, with a, a, a far-right political agenda, which um, he pushes through, and anyone who gets in his way gets killed, or maybe not gets killed, but drinks the wrong kind of tea. Or, or, or ends up like, or um, the like Vladimir Karamurza in a, in, a, in, a, in a jail. And, and... Yeah, or, or bangs up. Yeah. And and then um, then you've got people on the far right who are um, in the states and in Britain who have got some kind of uh, who echo um, Putin's far right agenda um, of kind of ethno nationalism who don't particularly like the 21st century mm-hmm. and and these people and what's frightening about this is that the, the, this message this populist nonsense um, it does. There are lots and lots of people uh, out there who who agree with them. I'm, I'm talking about, for example, uh, Donald Trump in the States and then Matteo Salvini, the, one of the far-right guys in Italy, just come out that the people who met his consigliere in Moscow, an Italian guy, the, the Russian interlocutor was in the FSB. That's a story insider. Right. Um, a Russian inter- um, and anti-Kremlin uh, Russian thing has just come out. And then you've got the people on the far right in Britain. Tommy Robinson, for example, he's been to Moscow. Of course he has. Mm. Of course he has. So what we're looking at is fake journalism by Tucker Carlson. You've got the, the, the contender to be the next president of the United States, Donald Trump, already screwing uh, military aid for the Ukrainians. And, and, and it does feel like the, 
this feels like 1938. Something's hardening. I, we should add to that mix, that ugly mix, the fact that both Boris Johnson and Nadine Dorries have used their Daily Mail columns to offer up support for Boris, uh, for Donald Trump in, in recent weeks. And nobody yet knows the full extent of Russian interference, of course, in, in the Brexit referendum. Um, I, I want, because you have some personal investment in this next question. T- Tucker Carlson claims that he was interviewing Putin because no Western journalist wants to. That's a dereliction <laughs> of duty from the likes of you and Stephen Rosenthal in Moscow for the BBC. I can't believe none of you have put in any interview requests. Steve Rosenberg, um, former Rosenberg, BBC, well, I've left the BBC, but yeah, he, he's, yeah, I mean, um, Putin has a kind of a bizarre press conference uh, once a year, and I think last time Steve waited for four hours to ask his question with a great big BBC sign, and, um, and Putin didn't call him. I, I um, in 2014, um, uh, after the shooting down of MH17, mm. by the way, uh, this is a tragedy in which like 200 Dutch people were killed, uh, lots of Malaysians, and 10 British people. This yes, was a big course. terror attack against British. Um, British 10 B- British people lost their lives in that. Um, and I went out to the crash site for BBC Panorama, and then we had a meeting in Panorama, and somebody said, how can we doorstep Putin? And it's impossible in Moscow. Security is too tight. And then somebody said, he's opening a mammoth museum in Siberia. And the editor of Panorama said, have we got any reporters that look like a professor of mammothology? And there you were. You didn't wear your hat in those days, did you? <laughs> I didn't wear my hat, but I did, my beard was bushy, and uh, and off I went. My aim was and, true. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and off I went, and uh, and I lined up with all the other professors of mammothology, um, and um, and then Putin pimp rolls in. But by the way, uh, it's in your cuts in Siberia where the mammoth museum was. He was opening it or something like this. And I was starving. It was, I'd been on the plane for hours and hours and hours. It's nine times um, east of, of uh, London, further, uh, further east than Beijing. And, and I said, I need a kebab. And the producer says, there's no time. There's no time. I, Stop it. I need a kebab. A wolf a kebab. And then... Uh, you, you know we're on the radio, John, don't you still? Yeah, no, no. yeah all right. Uh, carry I, on. Okay. I, so, I thought, so we're not in the pub? Oh, I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> it's 1.3 million people listening to this program every week. Wait for the anecdote. All right. So, um, so I rock up, and um, and as Putin comes in, I say, John Sweeney from the BBC, tell me about the killings in Ukraine. Oh, well Not just the Russians, the Ukrainians, but the Dutch, the Australians, the British, MH17. And he stops and answers the question. The Russian TV lights switch on. They think it's an organised question. It isn't. I've, I've jumped them. And then Putin gives a very long and boring answer. And, and I'm much taller than him. Yeah. And suddenly I realise that there's a problem with the kebab and it's squiffy. And I feel as though, oh dear, I'm going to projectile vomit over Vladimir Putin. <laughs> <laughs> and, and anyway, the kebab manages to stay, stay down, which is why I'm still alive, which is why I'm giving God, this, telling you this story. That would be a chemical attack, wouldn't it? Good grief. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, that's that's, that's, that, that's how hard it is to get close to him. And in fact, I don't know whether you know this, but the Kremlin <laughs> itself, because if you lie down with dogs, you get fleas, have actually contradicted Carlson's version of events and said, we get interview requests in all the time. Uh, and then I, I don't speak fluent Russian, but words to the effect of, but no one would tickle Vladimir's tummy quite as gently as you did, Tucker. So that the, even he's ended up looking embarrassed. And our friend Oz Katerji, and uh, very briefly on this, if you would, John, describes the reaction to this interview in Ukraine as being among the, the angriest reactions he's, he's ever seen. The anger in Ukraine today towards Tucker Carlson is unlike anything I've seen before towards any Western political or media figure. The rage is genuinely palpable. His name is trending here in both English and Cyrillic, and the responses are furious because, I, I mean, I, I, we've had a little bit of fun in this conversation, but for, for, from the point of view of Ukraine, this is no laughing matter. No, that's true. Um, Ukrainians are fighting like tigers for their democracy, for their ability to speak freely. And, um, and Putin is, I mean, you know, there have been missile strikes um, on Kyiv um, almost every day. Yeah. Um, down the south of the country, um, the war is brutal and it continues. And you get a, a, a great American journalist, so-called, telling unspeakable lies, lying about the war. It does feel like 1938. And, and it also, we, we, need to, we need to wake up. 
Yeah, and, and there are lots of people who say, listen, I, you know, I don't want to go to war with Russia. Fine. I don't want to go to, with, with war, go to war with Russia either. Sure. But we need to prepare ourselves and we need to be strong enough to be able to look Putin in the eye and say, stop it and get out of Ukraine. Uh, and and that, of course, is, is compromised by any normalization undertaken by Western journalists, however ridiculous or sullied their reputations may be. Thank you, John. Um, John Sweeney there, live from Amsterdam, where he is attending a conference, as you heard, with some exiled Russian journalists who know what happens if you ask Vladimir Putin questions that he doesn't like. Tucker Carlson providing something of a masterclass in how to ask him questions that he does. Just for, for the avoidance of doubt, John Sweeney invented the word mammothology. That is most certainly not the correct term to use to describe people who have made a study of hairy mammoths. Um, his latest book, Killer in the Kremlin, as far as I'm aware, contains no invented words. 12.52 is the time. I know that Kerry Menai Davis um, and the story of his little boy, Hugh, who died age six from a very rare form of cancer, t touched a lot of you when we met him a couple of weeks ago. And I promised him that he could... Um, use the radio station to, to, to keep everybody else up to date with how his attempts to um, find some, if you like, positives from that horrible tragedy were progressing. It's the difficulty parents have of making ends meet when they have to put everything on hold to look after a seriously ill child. And, and um, he has already availed himself of that opportunity because he has a little bit of good news that he'll be sharing with us, good-ish news that he will be sharing with us shortly. But before that, and of course by popular demand, I thought it was time we had one of these. Snake here, snake here. Snake here. So, you know, the Telegraph before Christmas started having a go at Keir Starmer for having done some lawyering when, when he was a lawyer. Um, I think it went to an even lower level during that interview in which he accepted the bet. This is what I was talking about. We've been very clear about his but Tahrir. They should be a prescribed terrorist organisation. Mm. We're bringing forward the legislation to do that. And again, you know, question for Keir Starmer. He, once upon a time, represented his but Tahrir. Actually, he, he supported them in resisting prescription elsewhere. And that is like, that's who he was on the side of. We're busy trying to ban these people. And he was busy trying to... Do you think he's a terrorist sympathiser? Well, I said, look, the, the facts speak for themselves, right? Like, he, there he was. He was their lawyer when they were trying to resist this. We've just prescribed them mm. because we think that's what they are. And I just speak... Again, these things speak to people's values. Yeah, the, the, the values of the right to a fair trial or the right to legal representation being something that I think is even enshrined in Magna Carta, isn't it? But not if you're Rishi Sunak. Absolutely extraordinary. Uh, here's what Tahrir, uh, uh, I mean, for my money, a nasty bunch of characters, but still entitled to legal representation, and, and, and Keir Starmer is a lawyer. But even if you like them, um, uh, they weren't terrorists when he represented them in law. So I, I, I was once maligned as a terrorist sympathiser by Nadine Dorries, of all people, um, when she was Secretary of State for, for Culture, Media and Sport, only in a retweet. But still, you know, it's not something that responsible politicians should be bandying around. But when it's Nadine Dorries, you can chalk it up as a, well, that's not really a responsible politician. That's a, a, a sort of ridiculous pimple upon the acne-strewn chin of public life. But that, that's Nadine Dorries. Nobody really took her seriously. But that's the Prime Minister engaging in similar behaviour, trying to somehow malign a lawyer for doing law. Uh, on an altogether more serious note, Kerry, Kerry Menai Davis, um, who you met a couple of weeks ago, told us that he was embarked upon what was expected to be a fairly long and winding road towards meaningful legislation designed to address the plight of parents dealing with the necessity of putting everything in life on hold and often seeing earnings freeze while you got on with the altogether more important business of caring for a seriously Ill, uh, Ill child, Hugh. Kerry's boy died aged six in 2020 after being diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. And, and from that tragedy comes this mission. And I, I told Kerry when he was here that he could absolutely uh, come back anytime he wanted to tell us how things were progressing. And, and things have actually progressed since we last saw each other, Kerry, a little better than expected. Yes, it sort of, um, yeah, went quite quickly. Um, as um, Thank you for having me back on. Very well. And um, just after um, I came on, we went to Parliament and we listened to the second reading of Hughes Law, um, which Oliver Heald put through. 
and um, he'd had discussions with Joe Churchill MP, who was or is the Minister for Employment in the DWP. And um, Joe Churchill decided that rather than go down the complete legislative process, which can take a lot of time, as you know, yes. um, she decided to give what we wanted straight away. So yesterday, Francis and I, and my wife, yeah. started work in the DWP straight away on working on ways that we can make life better for parents of sick children. Partly, I think, because Joe uh, Churchill has, has experience of cancer herself. I believe she's had um, cancer three times herself, yeah. I know, albeit that she's an adult who, who wouldn't have needed to um, uh, to be looked after by her parents. It, it, latterly, it, 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 I suppose it focuses the mind somewhat. This is remarkable, isn't it, really? It's actually going to happen. I, I mean, I, I, I appreciate that it's a, a victory born of tragedy, but you must be a little bit taken aback. I'm constantly being told by politicians that it takes decades to get anything done. Yeah, slightly overwhelmed when um, she spoke in Parliament. I, I mean, I don't really show emotion that much. It's not me saying anything, but I did, be honest, I did have a few tears in my eyes when oh. it went through. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's amazing, really. So yesterday, Francis and I went in. We had a really great, meaningful chat with members of her department and Sir Oliver Heald. And it's not just the financial element that we're pushing for. Of it's course. a whole holistic approach. And it's given us the opportunity to put loads of different options on the table, which we, we think would help parents who have had to put their life on pause. Because it's never you. E exactly. And one of the words that Joe Churchill used, which is quite true, you, you don't choose cancer, it chooses you. Mm. And, um, you know, especially with the news of the king recently, it doesn't matter who you are, it, 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 it can affect anyone at any time. And like I say, even if it's a child, which in our case, our firstborn son had it, mm. there's many parents around the country that have a child being diagnosed today, for example, and tomorrow. And we just wanted to make sure that you can take one burden away from them, really. And it's, it's, it's valuable work. And, and we can wish you continued luck, Kerry. Keep us posted on, on every development, if you would. And uh, if you're wondering why I use that phrase, it's never you when describing uh, what Kerry was talking about. It's because that is the name of the charity that him and Francis have set up in Hugh's memory, but based obviously upon the fact that you never think it will be you. And when it is, you've no idea what to do. It's a classic example of that trope we discussed together all the time, really, about things about which you know nothing until you suddenly have to know everything. And, and a cancer diagnosis, particularly for a little child, is uh, squarely and completely in that category. That, thank you, mate. Take care. That's it from me for today. If you missed any of today, it's been a, it's been a jam-packed show, hasn't it? You probably need to listen back on Catch Up on Global Player. Well, you can, and you can pause and rewind live radio as well, but don't do it yet because Sheila's here. Download it for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. That time, it's been a jam-packed show. It, jam -packed made, it show. made me think of like, you know, when you're little and you went to the cinema and somebody would, you know, introduce On Saturday morning. <laughs> Morning, yes. the ABC miner. Were you an ABC miner? I was an ABC miner. Yeah, it reminded me of that. So someone's going to have to serve Jam ice pack. cream halfway through the program. Pa, 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 pa. Pearl and Dean. Pearl and Dean. Right.